other people outside? No? Okay, guys, we're gonna get started again. Whoa, that was louder than I expected. Um, yeah, so Thomas is gonna finish up his example. Uh, for the people who may have just joined us, there is a website that you can access all this, this material at oh, brainhack101.github.io slash intro ml and most of the people in the room have figured this out at this point so if you can't find it ask your neighbor there's a slack channel in the brain hack slack where you can post questions andrew could you please share your presence oh yeah okay i'll get to that um so yeah thomas right. funk uh, is this mine oh i hope i don't need to re no Okay, do you need to rerun all this? Uh, okay, so did any of you guys have a chance to do exercise three for the pet unit stuff? Was anybody able to add an extra layer? All right, we got one person. All right. <laughs> um, what about exercise five? We're just trying to build the best network possible. Oh. What did you get? What was the, what was your test accuracy? Ah, uh, you can do better. <laughs> um, so, do any of you guys have questions? Do you guys want to work on this for like fifteen minutes, and then we'll go back to Andrews? Yeah, of course. Basic questions are. A cell, yeah. Um, so you don't have to, you can just modify what's already there, but if you do want to, um, all you have to do is uh, go to code plus, and then here you have your cell. Um, so you, if you write stuff, um, it'll run in Python. If you put an exclamation point, then it'll run like a sort of pseudo bash terminal. Oh, sorry, it's not gonna run now because there's other stuff running in the background. Um, but yeah, if you did something like that, then it would print out, it would work like a normal LS in the... Uh, just within this line, just within this line. Yeah, so the next line I could then, uh, sorry. The next line, I could do something in Python. So what if you did LS now without the exclamation point? Then it wouldn't work. Okay. It's only if you put the exclamation uh, mark beforehand. Um, that's, why, that's how you can mix Python stuff with like terminal stuff. So I guess I can go through solutions for number three. I mean, it's not very, oh, actually, I guess I'll start with one. Um, so the way to uh, decrease the number of parameters, the way I did it is very simple. You just have the number of kernels. Um, and in theory, you should get about 120,000 parameters as a result. Uh, where's the solution? Okay, well, it's supposed to give you 120,000. Um, so that's significantly less than what you get if you run it with all the kernels, where you get, I think, 1.9 million. Um, but the test accuracy isn't that much worse. I think it's 0.92 if you have the number of kernels. It's like 0.95 if you put uh, all the kernels or the normal amount of kernels. Um, so that shows you that dramatically increasing the number of parameters doesn't always produce correspondingly high increase in your uh, accuracy. Um, okay, how to add a layer? Well, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, so I believe this is the extra layer that was added here. So you just have to have another max pooling layer, so that acts as another downsampling. Um, so yeah, for the max pooling, you just pass con4 to it. Um, then you have your two convolutional layers. Um, and then here you upsample the, uh, the con5 uh, node. So that gives you up five, concatenate it with con four, and then that gives you uh, a concatenation layer, and then you just convolve it twice with another convol two con uh, convolution layers. So it's pretty straightforward. It's a bit, um, it's easy to get lost 
Like for a long time I was running with a bug where I had this as like con five or something like that. So you have to be careful. Um, and that's basically all there is to it. If you want, uh, another thing to keep in mind is just, I already mentioned this before, but if you do want to run this, uh, make sure that you run the uh, prepared data with bit pad base equals four. Because again, that's gonna, going to pad the input images and the label images so that you can divide them evenly by four max pooling layers. Um, because let's say you have your input images, which are 100 by 100. You can divide it once to get 50 by 50. You can divide it twice to get 25 by 25. But if you divide it a third time, then you can't divide it evenly. And then that leads to problems with uh, dimensions, where the dimensions don't match and Keras crashes. Um, so f is there a question? Uh, question number two. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, what was question two? Uh, oh, yeah. So there you just have to comment out, or I believe the conf2d transpose was commented out before. Um, so you just have to uncomment it, and, and it should run. Um, it adds a considerable amount of kernels, I believe. Oh, oh OK, there. Yeah, so you end up with 4.6 million parameters instead of 1.9. Um, so it adds a lot of a lot of parameters. So it's not clear if that's like really worth it, if that's the best place to put your parameters. Again, this is something that you have to like experiment with yourself. And that's kind of the fun of doing this is like once you've, the hard part is wrangling your data and putting it into the right format and getting it to feed into Keras. Once you've done that, playing around with different architectures is kind of fun because you can just sit and watch this, the training happen. Um, so yeah, uh, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, then you don't need to use that. How is this step superior? Um, so it's, I don't know that it's necessarily superior, but it adds more parameters because it basically creates um, a kernel that does the upsampling, and so you have to learn what that kernel is. So it adds weights for the kernel, and it adds more weights than you would have if you just do the regular upsampling 2D function. A lot of this feels like uh, trial and error and black magic. How do I look at the output of one layer and say, um, I think max, uh, max pull or drop out uh, after that would be better? How do I tell them? I look at something. Did Andrew pay you to, to ask this question? It's like <laughs> a, a perfect segue to what he's going to talk about. Uh, so it's interpretability. So indeed, this is really like black magic, or that's why people call it alchemy, because the there isn't that good of a theor theoretical framework to figure out why one thing works and one thing doesn't. So you really have to try different options and see what works. And I think that's why the, the validation, like uh, the cross-validation is super important um, because that's what sort of keeps you honest and it keeps you from creating some ridiculous model with a billion parameters that works super well on your data but then doesn't generalize. So the cross-validation is really where you uh, you have to be honest with what your model can actually do. Are you also saying, telling me that I should ask Andrew to pay me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't have any money. <laughs> 94.5? Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, yeah, for uh, the unit. same question about the dark magic. Uh, is there any kind of rationale that we could put? I mean, uh, it goes against the whole thing that you said that we don't want to bias it. But at the same time, like one of the things that didn't make sense to me is I think when you're ending up with just three possible regions or two possible regions in this case, when you are going deeper and deeper, you need less kernels rather than more kernels. I don't know. Intuitively, I have that idea. And like, I got this uh, with putting all of the kernel numbers into eight. Mm -hmm. So now I only have 90,000 uh, parameters, and I get 94.5. But uh. I mean, so <laughs> like the, the very naive models we had at the very beginning in the first example, which have like 4,000 uh, nodes, those get an accuracy of like 91% on the gray matter, white matter segmentation. So just adding parameters 
or adding convolutional layers doesn't necessarily help. Um, so I, I can't really, if it works, um, as long, I think it, it works, as long as you do the cross validation correctly and you're careful about having independent data in your training sample and your uh, test sample and having enough data in your test sample, um, I think that's what is really important for like guiding how you create your architectures. I don't, I mean, maybe Andrew has a diff different opinion, but I don't know that there's a, a rule of thumb as to how many kernels you should use at which layer and whatever. There's some theories, but uh, so I, I, I think you might want to try to balance the number of parameters you have at each of your convolutional layers, so you kind of share the capacity equally across your the depth of your model, maybe, mm -hmm. but maybe not. <laughs> maybe that doesn't make sense. And the deeper you go, the more complicated function you're trying to represent. So maybe you need more kernels to be able to, even though the space is smaller, <laughs> figure out the nonlinear model. <laughs> I don't know. It's <laughs> an open question. I'm good. If anybody else has questions, otherwise we can move on to the interpretability. So what's the maximum that you could achieve from this on exercise part? Uh, I think I got 96. I think I ran, yeah, 96. I don't remember exactly how, but yeah. But again, that's only with one sort of like training uh, validation split. So I'd have to do it multiple times because maybe I just got lucky on that. Okay, let's write the paper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's thank Thomas again. It's like maybe a little more difficult to demo, to prepare an example that's like a real problem and demo it so that it is educational than to show MNIST, which is 28 by 28 handwritten digits, which is most of the computer vision world. So. Thomas has done a lot of work. Um, okay, so <laughs> I'm going to attempt to begin to answer the question of how you can possibly interpret what these deep networks are doing. Um, so this is looking inside the black box uh, typically, this is the situation that we deal with. Uh, there's an XKCD comic for everything. This is your machine learning system. Yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Just stir the pile until they start looking right. And this is essentially the backpropagation algorithm. Um, but we're going to attempt with this body of other people's work that I'm going to present to you to answer more rigorously how it all works. So this is maybe the most dangerous talk I've ever given because um, black boxes, you know, the, the, the deeper the model inside the black box, uh, the, the, the closer to Vanta black you get. And if you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. So I was inspired to develop this because of a talk that was given at OHPM, at the Deep Learning Educational Course, where uh, Professor Alexander Binder, who is uh, a developer of this layer, um, layer-wise relevance propagation uh, method, uh, gave a talk. and. Uh, it was like pretty intense and I didn't understand a whole lot, so I still don't understand a whole lot, but I'll tell you what I understand of it. And there's basically two ways to start to, to answer this question of, of how it all works. There's you can either try to understand the model uh, or you can I I explain individual predictions that the models make. And there's a ton of different ways to do this, and I actually think that this is not the complete story, 
Um, and I'm going to tell you about it. So back to our little 17 parameter toy network here. We've got inputs. We've got outputs. This is typically what we look at in the black box. We put data in. We evaluate probabilities. So then when we look inside, we have weights that the neurons track. That's the part of the model that gets trained. And there's activations at the output of each neuron that are not only a function of the model, but of the data. So, so there's a lot of different ways you can start to ask this question of what is happening. And so the weights are just part of the model that we might want to explain. The activations are a function of the model, the data, and also maybe the class label. I kind of put this X in gray because uh, hopefully the activations of the neurons correlate with your class, especially at the end when you're trying to predict them. The inputs are just the inputs. Uh, and the outputs depend on the model, the input data, and hopefully the class label if you've trained a perfect classifier. So, so how, what do we want to explain exactly? There's like a million ways to ask this question, and I don't think any of our methods actually answer any of these questions and it's important to think about. Which inputs cause the output predictions? That's maybe causality is sort of maybe the point of all this. Um, and then you can also ask, how does the model represent this input data inside the black box? And what are the similarities uh, between the inputs that the model learns that, uh, that allow semantic representations of similarity between classes. Um, and so, so the strategies to start to address this, uh, most of them are based on linear, pro linear approximations um, so that we can explain this factor is related to this one with statistical significance or uh, and you know that's a very simple sentence to explain this nine million parameter nonlinear network. Um, so a lot of the ways to do this, especially in computer vision, is to project some sort of importance measure back into the input space and create a heat map of what's important. Um, but you can also design your model uh, so that you constrain what possible functions that it can learn. Um, so I'm going to talk about how you can visualize convolutional filters, visualize entire classes, uh, visualize the importance of the inputs for individual predictions, and then uh, talk a, a little bit about interpretable designs for deep networks. So AlexNet visualized the weights of the first layer um, cool. You get Gabor patterns, looks kind of like the visual cortex, um, but this is layer one. And after that, deeper filters are not as straightforward. You are taking nonlinear combinations of nonlinear combinations, and uh, you know you can't really map that to a to a little square anymore. The receptive field starts to get bigger. You're not really sure what the pooling is doing. Um, and batch normalization is sort of a big question mark. And so the question when we're trying to visualize filters is, so we've got this convolutional neural network. Uh, the red is convolutions. Orange is max pools. Do a bunch of those. Fully connected layer, soft max at all. What's happening for one filter in this deep layer? So what, what kind of patch in the input image does a single filter respond to most strongly. So let's say the weight looks something like this. Bright, bright intensities are, uh, are stronger activations and that the output for some input it produces this at a pixel. So you could, you could plot this and I'll show you how to do it in Keras afterwards but, but we've now like max pooled so that the space is like tiny so it's not as big as the input. 
and going backwards through the max pools and the reviews and it's maybe hard. So the first real like good effort to do this was this strategy called deconvolution. So for some input image X, some uh, filters are highly activated and you search for the highest activations in the layer and you try to impute the gradient that produced the activation of this filter like without actually knowing what it is exactly. So the activation is the strongest. So to do this, there's kind of sort of a hack. You do a forward pass, you put your data in, you record the locations of the max pools so that when you're going back, you can, you can put your activation through the ReLU in the right spot because otherwise you don't know because the max pool, does this make sense? So these, this, these maps are called switches in the paper. So on the forward pass, you maybe have some input to some deep layer like this. And uh, in the green area, the max pool only saves this. And so when we're trying to visualize deep, we only have this part. Does the cursor show up? <coughs> no. Yes. And to go backwards, you can't tell where, <coughs> which location it came from. So if you've got like 10 of these layers, it's like sort of just a blur. So this is one of the problems. So they had this hack of max location switches. You save this, this patch corresponds to this one. Uh, this one is this one. And with this, you can now map what area of the rest receptive field was the original location for the max pool. And layer one, they just plotted the filters. You can use this to have very compelling results for this uh, area that most strongly uh, activated this dog patch uh, in layer four. This is the visualization of what the filter activation looks like in the input space. And I mean, these are pretty compelling results. These kind of like uh, circular patterns I have some circular patterns here. Uh, there's lots more examples in the paper, but uh, for, for this column here, you've got some faces, but also some car wheels that, that respond similarly. Um, eyes seem to be picked up really well by this particular filter. So, so that's a good strategy for max pool. Um, but but there's, other, there's other things we've got to consider for the ReLU. Uh, so, so this is, when you put an Im input image in on the forward pass, you're, uh, you're, you're, you have some activation map at this layer L, uh, and, and this feature map is probably going to be pretty sparse once you've max pooled it. And then to go back to back up the chain and reconstruct the image, y you've set a lot of these to zero in RL minus one. So deconvolution, uh, it turns out this group, uh, Spring, Springenberg, tried to, to apply deconvolution uh, without max pooling. They instead strided their kernels and found that it no longer works at all. And uh, their hypothesis is that saving all the locations of the max pool actually conditions your visualization very strongly on the input. And and maybe you know the locations of the max pools is like a stronger contributor to that image than the actual model representation. So they tried to uh, replace max pool with strides, and we already talked about strides. But normal convolution, you're sliding the filter by one. If you had a slide, a stride, you're now sliding by two. Um, so yeah, what do we do with this rectified linear unit now? So normally on the forward pass, you have some input to a layer. Uh, some of it, the blue part is positive and the red part is negative. Forward pass through the ReLU, you clamp the negative ones to zero. And the, the positive ones are the same. 
So normally in backpropagation, you've got this gradient coming, coming up from a previous layer. Some of it is negative, some of it is positive. Um, and, and you propagate that up. But on the forward pass, this was zero. So you set these to zero and propagate the rest. So the deconvolution strategy didn't only took this back propagation up into account and not the forward pass. So, so this is what it would look like going to the input, these yellow, these yellow patches get clamped to zero. Um, and, and here's the math. Guided back propagation combines both of these ideas. And so now where the forward pass produced zero and where the backwards pass was, was negative is all zero. Uh, and this maybe produces some slightly better visualizations. So here's the results for these patches they, 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 that most strongly activated uh, an, an area. Deconvolution now without max pooling and this switches hack uh, sort of doesn't produce the nicest visualizations. And guided backdrop, you can start to, to see that these circular dark patches that are mostly dog eyes um, have this representation. And here's another example. Deconvolution fails. Guided backprop wins. When you're writing a paper, you show that your method works. <laughs> um, so the advantage of guided backprop is that it's very high resolution. You can project like very, you know, pixel dense uh, representations back into the input space. A disadvantage is it's not necessarily class specific. Um, and if you do this for the highest cat activation, it produces the same visualization as the highest dog activation, maybe. It's not 100% clear. <laughs> All right, so there's another method called sensitivity analysis. And, and this one's based on changing. So for an input, you've got some representation. What happens if we change a little bit? And there's a couple different ways to do this. You can uh, perturb the input and visualize it in the input space. So the kind of brute forcey works quite well method is to put a gray square and, uh, and keep testing an image and slide it around in all the possible locations and see how your cl output classification changes. Uh, and so this Pomeranian is classified as a Pomeranian when the square is occluding almost all of the image, but when it's right in front of the face, it, it does very poorly. And there's more results uh, that like when, you, when it's right over the pa face, it predicts tennis ball because there's also this tennis ball. And, uh, but this is maybe not how our visual system <laughs> interprets what we see. I don't think there's a gray square in our brain that's sliding over. <laughs> So the, the next method is saliency. And so normally, our network has learned some function y, which is a function, crazy nonlinear combination of all our inputs. We've got k features and uh, uh, over c classes. And I've made it bold to denote that it's a vector because the dimensionality starts to get out of control. This is the forward pass. And normally, in backprop, we take the gradient of the loss function with respect of the, of the true labels uh, uh, with respect to the predictions, and we try to minimize that with respect to the weights. So we're going to use different gradients now. And, and, and this is sort of difficult to understand. But if we, instead of taking the gradient of the loss function with respect to the weights, we now take the, the, the gradient of the output prediction, which is some function of the input, and we take a first derivative of that with respect to what we put in. And this is, this is actually the Jacobian, which I didn't like really fully understand until I made this talk. <laughs> 
Um, and so this Jacobian is different for each class. Uh, and, and you can use this, and, and, and basically this first derivative is the best linear approximation for some nonlinear mapping based on some geometry, anyway. So you can use this to make a high density importance maps. Uh, so a trained network, VGG maybe, for this dog, what are the important parts of this image that made it predict dog? And you can use this simple derivative to, to, to say these are the pixels that caused that decision. The sailboat, uh, it turns out the sail is important, but maybe the water also, because uh, sailboats probably in the training set are found in lakes more than deserts. And, and so this, this uh, I don't even know what this is, jackfruit? Does anyone know? It's kind of not lit as well, and the saliency is maybe more distributed. But it turns out that this isn't very class discriminative either. And um, you basically end up with the, salient, the same saliency map for every class prediction. So this is a problem. There's a whole different approach of trying to visualize what a, an entire class looks like, what the Pomeranian looks like in the input space to this trained neural network. And uh, you can kind of pose this as an optimization problem. You can do gradient ascent to find uh, the maximum classification for class C, uh, the, the input X that would find this class C. And uh, you have to regularize it so you don't end up with trivial solutions. Um, and you end up with these crazy looking maps that, uh, so this is uh, what the dumbbell class is represented as, as a class appearance model. So I, I'm not sure we're, we're getting anywhere near understanding here. I mean, it's sort of interesting. The Dalmatian class has some spots amongst the craziness. Um, but I, I do not understand more. Uh, so Deep Dream is another one of these methods. And uh, you, can, you can use them to, to visualize intermediate layers, too. And this is like maybe dangerous to do. Uh, this is another visualization of my brain that I put through Deep Dream, and now all of a sudden there's monsters appearing. Um, I, I had a party that was jungle themed, so I used Deep Dream to make this <laughs> crazy looking uh, visualization. Uh, DeepDreamGenerator.com. It's lots of fun. You don't even have to run code. So there's another strategy that uh, abandons this gradient computation and it, it kind of builds the model so that you end up with an interpretable prediction right at the end. And so class activation mapping, still pretty new from 2016. And now, so you've got like a regular convolutional neural network, you're probably pooling here, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then you take the activations of these and you do this global average pooling. So you take the average of all the activations and then you put it into a linear, a linear classifier that learn weights. So, so these activations now are across the entire field of the image if you use one of these propagation methods and you can multiply the weight of this linear classifier times the activation across the image and it's in the shape of the image to and then add them all up weighted combination to produce a class activation map these are the areas that were most important because these weights are linear weights and we can interpret them easily um, that's why it made the Australian Terrier prediction and you can actually do this in the defacing detector that I showed earlier. The transfer learning uh, Keras gives you an option to add the global average pooling. So this is like not super complicated to implement in that example. I didn't do it. I ran out of time, but I wanted to.
Okay, so the math is like maybe unnecessary, but, but these weights are times a spatially arranged activation, and then you, you sum them, global average pool over the image, and then you have this, this interpretability map. And then the classification score is just uh, some of the, the interpretability map, which is kind of compelling. Um, but it actually reduces the accuracy of your model if you design things this way, which, which is like maybe not ideal. <coughs> but we're, we're starting to get somewhere. So, so GradCam starts to combine a lot, of these, a lot of these concepts into more and more complicated systems. And so now we're, instead of the sensitivity of the output with respect to the input, which was the Jacobian, now we're going we're gonna to compute the sensitivity of the output with respect to some part of the model. And we're going to use global average pooling again, but not, not on the forward pass. We're going to have some derivative that we're going to compute after the fact that's not going to affect our model structure, but we're still going to end up with this interpretable heat map uh, and be able to project it back into the in input space. So here's the figure from their paper. You've got some image. It's got a dog in it and a cat in it. You put it through a convolutional neural network. And, uh, so, and then you've got these rectified ReLU feature maps. Um, then you put them to, to flatten them, put them through a fully connected layer, classify all the things. So now the feature maps are sort of the same, but you don't have to add global average pull them. And the decision now, Tiger Cat, if you take the derivative of that with respect to this feature map instead of the input space, then you end up with some weights that you can kind of infer, not based on a linear layer, but now based on this derivative. And then you can use those weights times the feature map through a ReLU to produce the same heat map. And this is the heat map for cat. And they've got really good, compelling example on their front page of their article. Also a fantastic GitHub repo. Um, so for, for the dog classification, guided backprop kind of produces this visualization where you can see the cat, you can see the dog. It's sort of like maybe just an edge detector. Um, GradCam gives you this low resolution heat map because um, yeah, because the, the, the class activation mapping is a little smoother than the high resolution derivative based methods. And then if you combine these, if you multiply them, you end up with just a dog face. And that's what's causing the prediction, according to these guys, these people. And if you compare it against occlusion map, where you slide the gray square, looks the same. And for the cat class, you end up with now a different prediction. Whoops, I scrolled. So now the guided backprop, you can see the dog and the cat. The heat map sort of activates the cat more fully, but doesn't pick up on the individual features of it. If you multiply them, it gives you just the cat. So this is a pretty cool technique. It's got the partial linear linearization that's not baked into the model now. Uh, you still need to use global average pooling, but, but you haven't constrained yourself to less accuracy. You can still build whatever model you want. Linear combination of heat maps that are interpretable, but <laughs> you have to do this ReLU at the end. And this is the big disadvantage of the method, um, is that it only models positive evidence for classes. And um, yeah, so I've used this for this quality co control project, which is kind of endless, and I've tried uh, many different things. And um, 
so I could maybe interpret this as saying that this correctly interpreted pass image uh, with no motion artifacts and no magnetic susceptibility artifacts was uh, interpreted as pass because the classifier is looking at outside and this is a good uh, area to look for signal to noise ratio um, and this fail image maybe has lots of noise in the background which is a good proxy for motion and some of the brain but but these are the these are the cherry picked examples that I chose to show you and there's lots of heat maps that don't really make any sense to me so negative evidence is I think very important like if you look at this image really quickly, it's two horses. Ah, but then you see there's this, this thing here. It's no longer a horse. This must be a narwhal or a unicorn. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's probably way more positive evidence for a horse than negative evidence, but it's like pretty clear to us that it's not a horse as soon as you see the horn. So, and this is really the, the major advantage of the layer-wise relevance propagation framework. And uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but basically the idea is that you've got some trained neural network, you propagate, you do backprop, you produce some output, and then you're trying to, from the output prediction, propagate layer-wise what is important in each of the layers all the way back to the input space to produce an interpretable explanation. And so they claim that a lot of different methods out there, this is like maybe all of the interpretability methods that exist from, uh, from this CVPR tutorial, um, I think it was this summer. And uh, so we've, we've looked at a couple of these. We looked at sensitivity, we looked at deconvolution, guided back prop. Uh, we're we're going to talk about Lyme in a second. Uh, and there's lots of different LRP with different rules. And basically, the LRP is probably the most mathematically uh, rigorous um, method. And, and, and basically, they have four principles, core principles. There might be more, because I do not have a full understanding of this. But the first one is that when you're propagating relevance, it has to be conserved. You can't have relevance that disappears and appears from layers because you know the forward function was d determined on the signal. And yeah, anyway, the relevance has to be positive. So irrelevant is zero. The most relevant is one, or you know wherever you stop your function they have this constraint of continuity, which I'm not 100% sure of, but small changes in the input should produce small changes in, in relevance if you have a good explaining function. And principle of selectivity. So if you've computed your relevance and you remove a highly relevant feature that should always decrease your prediction accuracy. So these all sound pretty solid as principles, except maybe the continuity. I don't know. A lot of people believe in smoothness. But uh, yeah, so this is the generic form of LRP, where this alpha term and, and this sum models the positive evidence, and the beta and these terms model the negative evidence. And you have to come up with some, some way to, to compute these based on the nonlinearities, the ReLUs and the sigmoids and the, uh, and the different types of nonlinearities that you use. You've got to work out a rule for max pooling. And uh, there are implementations of these, but there's a lot of decisions to be made too. And I think that you can make good ones. Oh, there's also the additional constraint that alpha plus beta must equal 1. And the alpha 0, no, alpha 1, beta 0 rule is like the kind of simplest form of this uh, that just ignores the negative evidence. 
and it has some major advantages. It's linear time complexity. You don't have to optimize anything. Uh, it's still five times slower to compute than like a regular prediction. Uh, it can model negative evidence, but you have to kind of handcraft a relevance propagation strategy for some of the, you know, every fancy new nonlinearity that comes out, every new learned pooling strategy, you now have to decompose it linearly into relevance rules. Um, so there's another method, Lime, which is like totally different. And, and they, they basically operate under the principle that, that increasing complexity, there, it, it means no interpretability, basically. So, and they try to find a local linear or explainable function that's for one prediction in this highly nonlinear classifier, maybe we can find a model that's going to be a good model for just that little region around the data sample that you want to explain the prediction for. So, and the GitHub repo is great. You can put any machine learning classifier or regressor into it and get an explanation and it automatically generates PNGs and web pages and it's good. So the idea is, so let, let's say you've got this two dimensional space and you've got this, your actual decision boundary, which is highly nonlinear. And for this red cross here, you want to find what were the input, the inputs that were important. And so you're going to compare it to all the data points around the input and come up with this interpretable linear model straight line and use that instead of try to explain the whole space in one go. So the explanation function they pose as an optimization problem where you've got some loss function between the real model f that you've trained and now some interpretable version of the real model uh, and we're going to search a space of interpretable models however you want to define them which uh, they give the examples of linear functions and decision trees because decision trees are pretty you know test one variable go this way test one Okay, you can decide what was important because you know what the tests were. Uh, and then there's this pi function that uh, defines like a distance of like what counts as close. Um, and actually if you make pi infinite, it converges to grad cam under some other uh, assumptions. And you have to penalize this optimization problem by the complexity of your models G, otherwise, you know, your best solution that will result in the closest approximation of your model G that's explainable to the real model F will, will just, you know, be the same model. Okay, so there's all these symbols. Basically, it's an optimization problem. You've got to generate data that is like the interpretable version of the data in the different space because maybe you know you have less dimensions now, uh, and and their implementation is like more or less a hack where uh, they just choose G to be linear models, um, and they do some uh, parameter that uh, they do some feature selection methods, uh, and they have a few implemented in their uh, in their GitHub package to uh, choose a number of important features and then fit a linear model and then use the weights to determine what was the most important. Uh, a proximity function, they just use the negative exponential of the uh, Euclidean distance, which is a uh, good similarity metrics. And uh, yeah, they just cho choose K fe fe features somehow. So then their, their function L, which they're trying to optimize, is the for the interpretable feature of the, the, the actual prediction and the, no, for the, the original 
square distance from their interpretable modeled version of it, find the minimum um, model with the weights that will, that will minimize this and be able to explain this. G is the interpretable linear model. You have some pi function, you generate a bunch of data samples and test it against your model, see if it works. Uh, one of our red crosses um, is over the line here, so this might not be the best model, but then you look at the weights and you can end up with some great explanations in like three lines of code. <laughs> so I use this uh, in this never-ending multiple sclerosis work where I'm trying to find important types of lesions in multiple sclerosis using unsupervised learning um, and then find which ones were the most important in predicting who is going to develop new lesions and who's going to respond to drugs. So I've got my input X and the problem is who is going to who is going to uh, get worse by having new lesions two years in the future? Um, and I come up with some, and well, Lyme comes up with some some measure. Lesion type one is really predicts that you're going to get worse. Lesion type two is uh, maybe not important, or maybe it actually protects you. Uh, depends how you want to interpret this interpretability method. So also, uh, Jake Vogel has used this in some work uh, on the Allen Institute's data that they've released. Uh, and he's done some amazing work on hippocampal gene expression data. And uh, using machine learning to predict the gene expressions which most, which, which most predict which uh, hippocampal subfield uh, you're in. Did I get that right? Okay. We'll talk. <laughs> um, but but basically, he has. Yeah. Okay. I should just let more. <laughs> and you can combine the predictions across the entire data set for. This probe, we had this gene expression, and we want to predict where we are in the hippocampus. Uh, what were the most important fe features, and how can we characterize the gene expression across the hippocampus like this? What's important about this? And some of them come up as really important, and it sort of is the same as the weights on the linear model, and it's good. So you can also build models that, that do something that you understand. <laughs> and this is where I think maybe maybe the interpretability is going to come from. So spatial transformer networks are really cool. You basically have a, a block that is going to learn a localization function. And, and you, could, you could just have this as six parameters, a dense, dense layer with six parameters and some convolution of the input. And then based on those six learned parameters, you apply some affine transform to your 2D image. And we understand affine transforms, right? Linear. And we can actually look at the input after it's been affine transformed. There's no nonlinearities. And then after that, you have another deep net, V, that does your actual computation. And so maybe that part is not as interpretable yet. But basically, you can show that over these big data sets where digits are rotated and you know, you've got some occlusion this spatial transformer network will find the digit, apply the affine transform, this, do this resampling on this grid, put them all into the same space, and then figure out that this is a 9. And this is just trained end to end with random initialization. So, so I think this kind of thing is very powerful. You could potentially use that with enough data for neuroimaging data. So the, one, of the, one of the big features of um, convolutional neural networks is this translational equivariance. So no matter where a pattern appears in the input image, it's, gonna, it's, it's not invariant because it doesn't spit out exactly the same activation. It, it, it's an equivariant activation that will appear where the input appeared. So for this filter, if the input 
changes, you're going to get the same representation after the convolutional layer. But this is not true for rotational invariance. So if you have the same input, input and the same feature, you end up with way different representations. And I showed you a way to use generators and data augmentation that slows everything down, that you can, you can learn these rotations. But that's maybe not how the brain does it. And I don't know if what I'm going to show you is how it does it, but it's definitely a smarter way to approach the problem, especially when you have limited data. So there's this method called group convolutions, where you learn some filter. Maybe this is the activation. These, these the colors correspond to the weights. And you can learn a rotational invariance by just rotating the filter and doing this four times. And now you've got 90 degree rotational invariance if you tie the weights and you need four times more parameters to do this but maybe four times more parameters is oh no you, no no you don't need four times more parameters but you do need to do four times more computation to compute the forward pass um, because these weights are going to be tied and it's going to be the same filter with the tied weights, like normal convolutions, you have shared weights, but you're sliding across the whole layer. So now you can start to do this in different rotational channels too. And so if you do this for our example here, you end up with for the four, convol four rotated versions of your kernel, the same re representation. So deep learning gets very complicated very fast. Um, I think that all of these interpretability methods uh, are prone to be overfit on because you can basically just try them all and pick the best one that fits your hypothesis and, and then you're just overfitting the linear methods again. Um, so really quickly, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> no? You all understand this perfectly. So, is the, the idea that once you have trained, you give it new samples and see what the net, how the network interprets the new samples? So, you're looking into the training set and see what it works? What is the network? Well, there's different methods. You can, you can try to just visualize what the filter responds to most highly and you select the most representative training examples or you optimize and then look at the activation or for a single decision you try to decide what part of the inputs were the most important or you try to see how the prediction changes with respect to the input and maybe none of these are what causes the decision <laughs> But they're all different ways that you can start to address it. OK, so I'm going to go back to my uh, hands-on thing. And I have one last section to show you. And this is why it's really a dangerous talk. Because the, all the stuff that I just showed you, which is things that I don't have like a particularly good understanding of and I'm sure not all of you have a fantastic understanding of there's a very good code on the internet that lets you generate these heat maps in like two lines so I'm going to show you how to do it and uh, yeah so I've, I've trained a model now I think and uh, individual predictions saliency you can um, you can use this uh, what's the GitHub repo's name? Ah, start at the beginning. Okay, so this is my interpretability section. And first of all, you can just show the activations for uh, different filters in your network. And this whole interpretability section assumes that you have uh, a model named my model 
which is trained. So like run a bunch of the earlier code and you'll probably have one. Uh, and then you can start running these and playing with the parameters and see how the visualizations change. So, so you can just loop through all the layers in the model. Um, and for the convolutional layers, we're going to show activation on the first training image for the first filter. So I, I'm just going to, uh, oh no, I didn't run the, I missed a block. Okay, yeah, I didn't make my test frame split. So you have to run all the way up to sequential API and then run one of these my model blocks. So I think I had one. Oh no, maybe it aired out. Ah, uh, live demos. Okay, 93,000 parameters. And train it. No, no, okay. What is happening? Maybe if I hadn't put so many memes in, it would be easier <laughs> to tell. Can somebody help me out here? Where do I go? Test train split. You got an error in your test train split. Oh, when in doubt, print all the shapes. Image data is not defined. Oh, okay, yeah, I needed to run this block. Thank you, Thomas. Now test hands for transplant. And we're gonna, yeah, that's the one I wanted. And then fit the model. Do, 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 do. Not training super fast. Okay, accuracy. Amazing. Black magic. Okay, so now we're gonna. I made this function and it does some weird stuff. Um, and then plots in a subplot, the original image, and the activation at the filter. So now we're just going to run this for all the layers, for one filter. And at the first layer, convolutional layer, oh, ignore. And uh, oh, OK, so we've got like some image of the brain. Here we got some blurrier image of the brain. Uh, now it's kind of getting blockier and blockier. and the first filter in this last layer doesn't respond at all. Um, which, okay, I don't know, for this particular image, for one filter in each layer, we've visualized something, but maybe that is not a full explanation of the model. So, we're gonna look at this Keras Viz pack package, very good implementation of Guided GradCam by the developer of Guided GradCam. Um, so we can just install it, and they recommend installing it from the GitHub URL rather than just pip install Keras Viz because this way you get the latest version. Um, and so, okay, so one thing about all these gradient methods where you're taking the, 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 the gradient of the output is that you have to remove the softmax layer because the softmax is actually based on the weights of all of the classes. So if you then start to take, you want to take the derivative with respect to one class, it, de it depends on all the classes because of this normalization. And TensorFlow, the way it constructs the computational graph, um, the dot compile function, you need to actually make a new graph. So, this, so that it has this utility that removes the last layer and just replaces it with a li linear layer. Hacks. Okay, so that's done. Oh, the first thing we're going to do is compute this class appearance model. Remember the psychedelic vis visualizations? Probably they're not going to be quite as satisfying. Oh, oh, doesn't work. 
Invalid argument exception. Hmm. <laughs> I do not know what this means. I swear this worked last night. Um, this might be related to the out of memory error. My model, am I using my model? My model, layer index, filter indices. Is this working for anyone else? No? You're just watching me? Okay, well, maybe my scrolling randomly <laughs> didn't, didn't do too well. Uh, I'm just gonna skip it. It doesn't produce a good visualization. Uh, so we're gonna move on to the heat maps section. Um, same Keras Viz package lets you use this visualized saliency method to, to do that Jacobian based method. And uh, come on, big money, big. Oh. Okay. So I'm going to try to train another model. Maybe this will work. And my model, train it. Ooh. This is not an error message I've seen before. I'll fit. Oh, OK. Yeah, that was the. Ah, you guys didn't bring your own computers, and now I'm out of memory. Uh, OK, OK, OK. Uh, so I'm going to restart. And if this doesn't work, Joseph. You're next. Uh, okay, so go back to the beginning, and we've got to now. Uh, I think Keras is installed already. Data is downloaded. <coughs> Label array is created. Now it's in one hot encoding. I don't remember what this does. Uh, oh, yeah, loads the images. Test train split and make sure the distribution's good. Um, and then I'll run this model. Come on, train. Come on, train. <laughs> OK, well, I'm going to submit a ticket to Google. Manage sessions. Oh, yes, I'm going to terminate you. Oh, this is the problem here. I'm terminating you. OK, who said that? Gold star. <laughs> Oh, wait, wait, wait. So maybe I don't have to run all of this anymore. But if this doesn't work soon, then maybe me trying to debug live is not worth all of your time. Come on, train. So there's also, like, I wrote a bunch of text, and this is still not working. Um, You're someone else's laptop. Yeah, you wanna you wanna come up here? Yeah, come on up here. <laughs> so I'm just gonna show you. The GitHub repository has like a great tutorial. It automatically generates all these explanations. Has, has tutorials for tabular data, that kind of thing. I'm just wasting time at this point. Um, OK, do you have VGA? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, Windows guy. So, yes, we have 
Okay, you want to take over? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Um, so do you have a way to duplicate display? Extended display. Yeah, it's working. Okay, hooray! Now my mouse is no longer connected. Whoa, which way does this scroll? <laughs> okay, so this class appearance model is weird. <laughs> but, you know, there maybe is some information here. Um, there seems to be more information in these more psychedelic areas than the blurrier corners and edges, which is maybe picking up because we trained. I don't even know if we trained with the flips. So for individual predictions, this saliency, if you run it uh, on the de defaced, on the actual class label for this image, which was correctly predicted, Oh look, we get saliency in the nose and the face and also maybe the skull, um, which maybe not the best <coughs> predictor. But if we run it on the other class too, oh look, we get the same saliency map that is important for predicting the wrong class. So, so this is fine um, and is a great way to explain deep learning. <laughs> Uh, so now, uh, the other, the, the more advanced way is the grad cam. Okay, shift, enter. And now, you know, this, this cats and dogs example that was so compelling, now the prediction is on this outside edge of the image. That's what's important uh, for the prediction, which was correctly predicted. But, like, maybe that's not so good. And but so there's this is this is without the um, guided back prop multiplication which made it high resolution. So let's let's add that. Uh, we can try the other prediction method that's implemented that I don't even remember what it is now, uh, and select the best one from our paper. And uh, you know maybe that's rigorous. Okay. So but the guided back prop does look like it's a little better. But I'm not sure that this is maybe the, the right way to do it. Lime. So the way Lime works is it selects an interpretable model. And the way it does this as implemented in the Lime package for images by default is that it computes super voxels. So it groups the image based on uh, distance and similarity into like similar regions, and then and then tries to compute the the class based on perturbations of like the average value of those regions. Maybe I I don't know I haven't looked in the code, but it does something like that. And you know like maybe if you don't understand that you shouldn't use it to report causal inference results. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've uh, loaded an image and we're going to try, uh, okay, uh, run this show lime explanation function. And for one image, we're going to pick five of these super voxel areas and, uh, and try to explain what, the, what was most important in the prediction in a couple different ways. So, so it, one of them is the face. Hooray! Um, but, but I don't know how much information, why this contributed to the prediction, or how strongly. And uh, we have some negative evidence. Uh, like how <laughs> what I'm trying to convey is that none of these methods are perfect because it might be impossible to uh, come up with a 
linear explanation for a highly nonlinear system. And uh, you can try all of this, but uh, basically your explanation can't be wrong if you never understood how it was generated in the first place. And maybe this is not a way to do science. So relevance propagation is maybe the best hope, but I don't understand it fully. And uh, the only impl implementation for Keras is this investigate package, which also implements a, a, a bunch of other in interpretability methods, not all of which I've talked about today. Uh, but the documentation is really like not very good, and I couldn't figure out how to implement the epsilon alpha 1 beta 0 learning rule. And so their default that I adapted from the tutorial, the heat map looks like this. More evidence in the deep brain than, well, there is some in the face, but science. So, for example, in the, in the super voxel uh, model that you see that there are three regions, but then to you, only one of them makes sense. Is there any uh, rationale way to remove the ones that are not? Because you don't know which weights you need to adjust to remove <coughs> those irrelevant super pixels or super voxels. Is there any way that you could basically take this and feed it back into the system in a way that it would remove the two irrelevant ones? Well, so the super voxel maybe works work is a more uh, a more better assumption um, for kind of uh, natural images where you expect that there's like a sky and you know a table and you can group things into regions based on pretty similar colors and stuff. But maybe that assumption doesn't hold for MRI images or EEG time series. Uh, you know, if you just take these algorithms out of the box and apply them all and pick the one that fits your theory, maybe that's not amazing. And that's what radi radiologists all use GradCam. They all have a heat map, and that's like state of the art. We got a heat map, and it sort of read where the lesion is, so artificial intelligence. But I think like we really need to dig into the math behind these methods, understand it, and not overfit our interpretation of how it works, and try to do science by trying all the things and picking the one that fits our uh, <laughs> and you know cross validation is now like pretty well understood in the maximizing prediction accuracy and making sure that your prediction error is actually a valid estimator but what I've just showed you is a great way of trying all the things and making a figure or citing some paper that nobody understands and <laughs> But I think it's super important direction of research to follow. But that if you do pick up Keras, maybe don't use this until you actually believe that it's a real effect. So that's all I've got. It's over. Um, I hope you understand all of the interpretability methods. And I really think that the, the building your networks to structure them as the data is structured, doing things like graph convolutions when your data is organized on a graph, instead of smashing it into a Euclidean grid and sliding square pixels. Of this Facebook data set that they just released, is they, they've released it in the K space as well as nifties. And you know that's how the data was acquired. So maybe that's a better space to analyze it in, and we can reconstruct MRI images. And because you lose information, turning it into some domain that we can understand, rather than the actual structure the that the information was acquired in. And the more you do to your data, the more information that you lose. So yeah. That's all I got. Does anyone have any questions? Otherwise, Joseph? Mm -hmm. Yep, your turn.
Maybe we can take a five, ten minute break while you get set up and. Andrew, you. Well, for super resolution, you, you you ideally have the high resolution version, and that is so. It's like a regression problem, but in different space. And yeah, you can use like almost all of these methods for for that. You have to adapt them a little bit. But like Lime works out of the box for regression. And they're all like super easy to implement, and the GitHub <coughs> links are there. There's tutorials for all these things because the developers want you to use them. Uh, and I think it's important to understand the positives and negatives and the assumptions that each of the methods make. Um, so, so I think like GANs do really well at this. Like, uh, I mean, you could you could use a UNet to learn a T1 to T2 mapping, but the generative models work better if you can train them. But it's harder, and it takes longer. Yeah, like uh, a lot of the natural language processing stuff. So there's like uh, lots of super cool work on image captioning that generates a caption for an image that you know is like pretty magical, <laughs> or generates an image from text and has this inverse. You can do both. So yeah, do we want to take a five minute break or do we want to go straight into Are the next? Can't, which laptop is going to, can we keep using here? Uh, mine. Oh, so I sort of got sidetracked there. Uh, did I turn this off? No, I didn't. Make your break and then fix it. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Five minute break, we're gonna come back at three. Mm -hmm. Close all the runtime. What do you think? It was good. You didn't uh, talk about uh, the disbias uh, hallucination. I don't think that was I happened today. What? The, the distribution match. Uh, I don't know anything about that. The tumor this is like a hundred percent of what I know. Okay, is what I just presented. <laughs> ah. No, but the tumor hallucination stuff. You presented it before. I like very briefly. Presented. You did? Oh, you didn't see it. Get all the information about the tutorial. Uh, I the, missed the morning session. It's in the, so on the Brain Hack website. The Brain Hack. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this URL. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Right, the website has changed. I don't know click. Um, okay. Um, is this the one? I saw on Twitter. No, this is like an old version of that. Yeah, so I have a problem with finding the, the entry. Yeah, so the intro, intro ML. This is it. Okay, okay. So if you go to this website? Yeah, yeah and then forward slash intro ML. Uh, 
Um, well. Correct. Right, okay. And then deep learning from our image. Not really. Okay. And then if you scroll down, there's links on the. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah I see. So this yeah. is the one that's going to come up, and then there's like the no Sure, okay, okay. There, yeah, 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 yeah. So I got the first one mm -hmm. from the neighbors, but uh, I'm missing the rest. Okay, thank you so much. It's free and online, but I couldn't find
Okay, guys, we're going to get started again. Um, so, Joseph Paul Cohen is a postdoc at the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms, and he's, uh, he's one of the few people who uh, care about the squishy biological stuff that uh, some of the neuroscientists work on. Um, and uh, he's prepared this excellent uh, uh, review of applications with the hands-on of word to vec and uh, I'm excited to hear what he's going to present to us. Thank you. <laughs> so in case you're sick of uh, hearing about image algorithms all day, <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of text. Um, okay, so specifically on uh, medical records and how, uh, how kind of deep learning works uh, and the stuff that actually works. Uh, There's a lot of stuff that doesn't really do anything. So we'll just talk about the stuff that does. Uh, okay. okay, so if we look at the trends in uh, where people are researching um, deep EHRs, uh, medical records, are, oh, oh, are on the rise, specifically in uh, the areas on the right here. So we can see uh, uh, over the years this rise overall, and specifically in uh, representation and prediction, which I guess those are pretty general terms. Uh, and the tools that they use are largely unsupervised. This is the largest category, um, which includes word of right? Um, and in there, uh, autoencoders or skipgram, these are all word of models. Um, but the, the idea that we're learning in an unsupervised manner is, uh, is good for like discovery, right? So we'll focus on these pieces today, which covers a lot of what is happening in recent years in deep EHR. All right, so the, the raw, data that we're going to be working with uh, is going to be clinical notes or clinical publications when it comes down to just the text that we're going to be able to analyze. Uh, and one big piece when we're learning to represent uh, these things is, is uh, representing different concepts like a patient or a doctor or a visit or a specific disease. And with this we can, uh, uh, we can um, relate these uh, concepts together. So uh, if two patients are similar they might respond in a similar manner to a treatment. All right, so we need to be able to discover that, uh, and it's good if it's a, in an unsupervised way. Um, you could find that, that two drugs are the same, and then you could say, well, maybe if we try this one, it'll have similar effects based on like, the symptoms and the ways it's used, been used to treat given some hospital systems uh, data. All right, great. So when I say word embedding, what, what does this mean? So we can think about this as a dot in some space here, visualized in two dimensions. This is usually like a really high dimensional vector, or it could be a very small dimensional vector. It depends on how uh, you configured your model. Right? So we'll see how, how we can control the size of this, this latent space that we want to be working in. And what we can do here is look at the relationships between these points. Right? So similarity uh, and, and grouping of them is going is to give us information on what, what they mean. But also um, looking at the relationships between them. Okay, so. What can we do with these embeddings? Uh, in 2013, maybe you've already heard about this example where uh, you can do arithmetic on words, uh, and you can say the vector between man and woman is the same vector between king and queen because it encodes the same relationship between the words. Um, so you could you could just take the vector between man and woman, with man and woman, and add that to king, and you should res you, sh you should you know resolve the point queen, right, or something that uh, is close to the concept of queen. Um, so, if we have these uh, embeddings, uh, we can use them to encode things like, uh, like if we have a paragraph of, of free text, if we have an embedding for each word, we can combine those together to have like a single vector, which is important, as you've seen with neural networks so far. Um, it's very easy to work with things that are f a fixed size, right? We'll talk about RNNs in the future, uh, but when you have things that you can just collapse to a single vector, it makes everything easier to work with. Right? Um, so we can also use this in RNNs, right? So if, if you have an RNN, which we'll talk about more, uh, and you're, you're processing each word in a sentence, right? Depending on how much data you have to train, uh, you might not capture the full representations of the words in your small data set. Let's say you have like 100 medical records, right? And you want to make some prediction. Uh, if you had an embedding, like a, a vector for every word that represented the, the contextual meaning in like you know, very good detail, you could use this in place of just a generic representation of the word 
and you'd have you'd be able to carry this data over uh, or this representation over from something like word um, like Wikipedia. So let's say you train on the the concept of words from Wikipedia, and you could carry this data over into your into your smaller model through these word embeddings, right? Or or in, you can imagine any context where you have a a larger hospital and you carry this to a smaller sub cohort uh, that you're going to use uh, to make a prediction, right? Right. Uh, and so some cool studies you can do, and I haven't seen this in medical field, maybe this is what you guys can do soon, uh, similar to this thing that uh, Will Hamilton did in 2016, uh, looking at the, um, the cultural shift of the meaning of a word. Right? So if we look at the word broadcast in the 1850s, uh, we can see that if we, if we train, if just using the context of that word from, 2000, from, from uh, 1850, Right, we have all the, all, the, all the texts that it was referenced in, right? Uh, and we consider that an independent word from the modern day word of broadcast. We can actually look at how these two words find themselves in some latent space, right? So we'll treat them as two different words, and they should like come together if they mean the same thing, or they should kind of stay apart if, they, if their uh, concept has shifted, right? So we can see in the past broadcast um, had to do with farming, right, with seeds and, and, and spreading stuff. Uh, and now uh, it means the radio. Right, and that wasn't the original use of the word. So, understanding how concepts move like this uh, could be interesting. Great. Okay. So one uh, note uh, on how we can encode these words. So one strategy, uh, one word embedding. This is a valid word embedding. Right, is a one-hot vector to encode a specific word. Right. So we have these these cat dog house. Uh, if we want to have a vector, a fixed length vector that represents each one of these words, that's that's uh, you know unambiguous between the other words that we can use in our models. Uh, we would just have a big long vector, the length of every word in our vocabulary, right? So we'd have to like take some text and tokenize it. So we, we find that this like a word I, uh, and then you, you chop out each word, uh, and you'll consider that one of these elements, right? Uh, and then you assign a single bin here that has a one, and the rest of them are all zeros, right? And this is going to be our one hot encoding. And this is, this is really great. Because when we kind of do this uh, linear transformation, right, we do a little dot product with this, this one hot vector, we end up slicing out a single column of a matrix. And that, that matrix is our embedding. Right? This, gives, this, this vector represents this concept. Right? Um, so then we can do things like the, the, uh, combining these. So if we wanted to represent a, a, a sentence with two words, we could simply just take the, you know, the, the product, the, the or, we could do a logical or, or just take the summation between these two vectors, uh, and we get two bins that are, that are on. And then that represents a, a whole sentence, right? Depending on some, some set of words. All right, so those are some good prerequisites here. If we, if we then use that, that kind of representation in the word vec fashion, um, what we want to do is learn a representation for each word. Uh, based on the context of that word. So in, we have this, this example sentence at the top, right? Involve it, we're just a snippet from some bit larger text, involving respiratory system and other chest symptoms, right? Uh, so here, we're going we're gonna to slide through all the, the, the words in our corpus, and we're going to focus on one. That's going to be our, our, our target word. And then we're going to uh, predict the context of that word given this word de vec model, which is just an autoencoder or a linear autoencoder. So we have system, and then with a context window size of two, right, we'll conclude the, the, the words uh, right to its side. So respiratory here and other. That's the, the first context size. And then we go all the way to two, so we'll also include involving and chest. Right? And we'll, we'll like just cut out and because it's like a fill word that's not going to mean much to our context, right? Um, so here, the word system, yeah. Um, do you, is there a predetermined list of filler words? Or yeah, so yeah, you pick. You pick. Yeah, so there's some libraries that'll help you tokenize some text. But you'd have to say like, and, or, if, a. You'd have to like, you have to make a list of these. Uh, you can grab things online, but they might not all represent uh, uh, stuff in the terms of the actual data that you're working with. Um, but yeah, there are like NLP toolkits that will have pre-canned lists, of you, but you should always check what you're removing. Um, great. There's also a lot of data cleaning that you have to do with these because if you if things are in parentheses, is it another word? Is it the same word? Should, should you filter out parentheses? Maybe they matter. So it's 
Uh, if you're talking about compounds or something, you have some reference to a compound in the use parentheses to like actually denote a point, then this is uh, bad. So to tokenize it, tokenize, tokenizing the, the words, the corpus, is a very, like another challenge. Right? Um, but if we assume we get it to some point that makes sense for the specific task you're working on. Okay, um, okay so what we're going to do is uh, take this word system. We're going to have a one-hot vector that represents system. Okay. Then we're going to feed that through a linear transformation in this model, if we focus on over here. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're going to project it down to some dimension we choose. Here it's two, so we get some real numbered two-dimensional embedding. Okay. And then from this two-dimensional embedding, we have to reconstruct its context. And its context is going to be a multi-hot vector representing the words in its context. Right. So we have these four words. So here, only three are shown. I should put some dots. Um, uh, but the only, there's only four ones in that entire vector. Not the one shown here, the, the one that it's, it figura figuratively represents. right? Um, and the rest of them are going to be zeros. So there's a lot of zeros here. right? And this is one training example in our word vec model. OK? Um, so the context of system, this is not the only context that system will ever have when it's used. There'll be another sentence where the word system is used, and it's going to have a different context. Right? So we're going to have another training example there where we, we have the same input, but a different output, okay? with like a diff different set of words uh, are, are going to be uh, on. Right? So if you think about this as a solution, as like a um, a, uh, a model that we're going to solve precisely, that, that's not true, right? Because we're going to predict the context for that word the best we can, but the context are going to be fighting with each other. So we're just going to have to find like a generic representation of the context of that word to reconstruct. That'll kind of minimize the overall error. Question? Yeah, so how do you optimize the dimensions? Uh, in, in the middle here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you have, to, you have to pick it. It's a hyperparameter. Yes. So you can uh, you can like try something, and then you see how it works, and then if it doesn't work, so we'll go over this a little bit later. Like th that's a hyperparameter. You have to you kind of look at the results and see if it makes sense. A lot of this is going to be there's a lot of randomness that's going to go on with uh, just like the representations that are learned. Uh, but generally, two maybe too small. So you're going to learn something that's like compression. But I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, okay. So. Uh, th when we reconstruct the context, we're going to have a loss there that, that's giving us gradient to train the network, right? But we can never solve this perfectly, so we're always going to have this conflicting, you know, uh, error. Uh, because maybe this is the only context where respiratory is is mentioned, uh, so it it has to you know predict respiratory, but just a little bit because m the majority of time there is no respiratory in its context, but sometimes there is, right? So you have this like slight. Uh, prediction of respiratory because we'll be predicting numbers between zero and one, but the lo our loss function is defined on this hard zero or one. Right. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. Those mappings linear for now. Yes. Yep. So where, where Devec is going to be linear. Yep. Um, great. All right. So if we look at the training in progress for where Devec, it's going to look like this. This is one instantiation. Each point here is a word in the vocabulary. Uh, and then we're just projecting it to the first part, the first linear transformation, into two dimensions. So this is not some, some TSNI or some higher level PCA. This is actually what the word embeddings are. So it's, it's nice to do stuff in 2D because you can just, just see it. right? And then you can watch it while it's training. So this is actually from start, the first, the first here. You know, it's all random. And then it converges to the train model. Right? So every step, it's refining the prediction of the context so that it minimizes overall the error across all the different contexts of each word. Yep. Did they label all the time for a context? Uh, sorry, I didn't. Did they have labels for the context? Uh, no, well, the, the context is defined from the, the data set you're using. So you just say, I have a context of two. So every time the word system appears, uh -huh. I look at its context. And then okay. each one of those, that, that's, the, that's your training data. So this is unsupervised. We have no. We have no like Just label. Look at what is around. This is the context. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a, a phrase to keep in your head uh, is like these three points, right? To kind of get this. Uh, 
Each word is a training example. Okay. Uh, each word is used in many contexts, right? And then the context defines the word, right? So you can have like a context where it's the word is used out of context. That's going to be in Wikipedia all the time. They're going to be like using uh, the word in a way that that doesn't match its real definition. It could be uh, uh, just an error um, that, that that when someone is writing. But if your corpus is big enough, right? It's that that that's that small erroneous training example is not going to matter. Because the majority of the time is going to be trying to predict a context which satisfies the majority of the context. Okay? Okay. Any more? Okay. Good. So this is some training. And if we go right to the end, we should see this frame. And then if we look at man, woman, and king and queen, right, so we look at the vector between man and woman, right? We take the same vector and put it you know, from king, we're going to see it kind of like goes in the middle of nowhere, right? Because this, re this representation was on a very small set of data. Uh, but also, you know, it's not perfect. But if we look at the closest word, luckily it is queen, right? It's also the word is, but this is maybe an artifact of, uh, of training here, right? Okay, um, good. So we've kind of trained the space and then, then took a look at it. All right, so now uh, you guys should follow along. So um, on the website, and if you get this link from the slides, there should be a link to the Word Devec uh, IPython notebook that you can open up inside Colab. Um, so everyone should load that up. So it should look like this. All right, so the first thing uh, is to install a bunch of stuff. So if you just run this first block, it'll probably give you some warning that says, trust me, and then please do, and then install all this stuff. Um, all right, great. All right, great. And then uh, I'll just walk through this a bit uh, to kind of get us started, and then I'll go back. Yeah. All right, so the first thing this is going to do, we're going to import a bunch of stuff, and then we're going to define a corpus. So here we have a very small toy corpus, but later there's, there's going to be more data that's coming. Uh, but this we can train very fast. The other stuff's going to take a bit longer. And then to reference the, the question earlier, so I wrote this little cleaning function which is going to remove these filler words as I've defined them as filler words, right? So I believe is a and as and two are irrelevant to this uh, task of predicting things, right? So it's just me influencing the data, there, right? Uh, but also things like slashes. Th th this is not in this data set above here, but these slashes, question marks, uh, and brackets, these are all going to be in a, a different data set we're going to look at later. Okay. All right, we can skip over all this and kind of visualize what's in the corpus, right? So we just like grab the first 10 lines of this. Okay. All right, so we can tokenize and clean the corpus. So for this is just saying for each sentence, right? We're going to run clean, which is going to strip out all these filler words as well as strip out all like the, uh, the punctuation, right? And then we're going to split it into an array of strings. So right now they're just a full string, so we're just going to split into an array of strings. Great. Right, and then we're going to merge this um, all together. Right, and then we can pull out our vocabulary. So now we've pulled out this vocabulary here, right, as well as um, made some handy mapping functions, right. So now we have, we can take any word and get an index, right. And the index is going to be useful because if we have a number, that uniquely identifies each word, what can we use it for? Question to the audience. Yes, 100 coding. OK, good. Um, great. And then we also have ID to word, so we can go you know, back. OK. Good, good. All right, so uh, let me move back to the slides. I have some better annotated uh, things here. 
All right, so we have this tokenized corpus, which is a bunch of strings in a, in a, in a list, OK? Um, and then we can, uh, so eat this sentence uh, is going to look, uh, once we remove the filler words from this, Paris, France, capital, right? So you can imagine what filler words were there, right? But this is what, I guess, kind of matters for the context. Um, and then we map those to indices, right? So we have this, it just happened to be that the number 2, 5, and 11 were assigned to these words just based on the order they came in the corpus, right? So there's no, there's no logic to these numbers. It actually doesn't matter the order of these numbers we're going to use. Uh, okay, so then what we want to do is grab the, the window around each word, right? So we're going to need to grab um, uh, the, the center word that we're going to focus on. So this is our target word. Right? So it's just for each word in the corpus. Right? We'll focus on that. And then we're going to grab the window, right? which is going to be W here. So we're either going to start with um, minus 2. So it's like the word minus 2, the word minus 1, the word, the word plus 1, plus 2. Okay? So I'll have um, this way oh, to sample the context and build up our training examples of each example, OK? Um, great. So what we end up getting right, uh, are these pairs, right? And the reason they're pairs, so I, I, I said before that we're predicting the context as a multi-hot. This was kind of a, this is a simple, this is what we want to do. But the way that we're going to train the network is one to one. So we're, we're going to be making redundant training pairs. Right? So here we have the output 16 maps to 12, and then 16 also maps to 1, right? So this is the, this is the equivalent of a, uh, the single hot, like the one hot 16 vector um, going through the transformation, coming back up, and predicting both 12 and 1, right? And then they're equally weighted, right? Because, so it's, it's, it's as if we were, so if we, if we ran this transformation twice and then calculated the error, it's the same thing uh, as, as predicting a multi-hot vector on the way up. Everyone clear on this? Is that, yeah? The same error. The same error. Oh, oh, okay. So um, we're going to do the reconstruction error. So we're going to predict, uh, let's say we're going to predict 12, and we're going to predict 1. Okay? And then for each one of those, we're going to have like a, a loss term, like a binary cost entropy. It's going to happen on each one of those. So it's going to be pulling whatever we predict to be 1. Okay? Um, and if we had. Uh, if we treat them all independently, right, we're just going to be summing those error terms together in the, in the, in the end. So for one example, we're just going to take the sum over this. Yeah. Everyone else? Good. Okay. Great. So, so now we have our, our, our training examples. right? Uh, now let's talk about how we define the script gram model. right? So it's two linear transformations. And we can write it all out right here. Uh, so this is in PyTorch. So in PyTorch, the style is you define a module, right? And this is going to do all sorts of magic when it comes to training. Um, but we're going to instantiate it. It takes a, a vocabulary size and an embedding size, right? And then we're going to have a transformation from the number of words in the vocabulary, right, to map to our embedding, and then back to the number of words in the vocabulary, all right? So we just define these two matrices, right? Uh, Kind of, you know, in an order, right? But in a, in, a, in a weird order. But we have uh, embeddings times the vocabulary and vocabulary times embeddings. Okay, so W one, W two, and this is how we do our initialization. So this is like when we first define the model. These weight, these weight matrices are just identified. They're just uh, um, initialized randomly. Right? Now, when whenever we do a forward pass to this model, what we're just going to be doing um, is reconstructing. The, uh, the, the result, right? And then and computing a loss to say, what, what's the output prediction given this, given this word, right? So we'll take our focus word, which is a one hot vector, right? That's the vocabulary times one. And we're going to take the dot product with w1. So that gives us this vector z1, right? z1, the dimension of that is the, the size of the embedding, right? So for the example we had, it's two. But this could be any size. Then 
we take this z1 and project it back through w2, which is going to give us something that's the, the size of the vocabulary, right, as the output. Um, and then for that, uh, on top of that, we're going to do a softmax. Okay, who's familiar with a softmax? Okay, good. So I have slides for, for everyone else. Um, so let's talk about the softmax. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, a good way of, of thinking about this is what, what we want to predict, right, is a, um, is a probability distribution over the words, right? So what, what our network's going to predict without a softmax is this like a unnormalized probability. That's the way to think about it, but it's just like wild projection in some space, right? And we really need to like uh, pin it down to be within the range that we want because that's how we're going to think about our error, right? And our error is going to be um, you know, kind of, we want to predict one, right, as our, as our target to say that that word is in the context. So we can't predict, you know, five. It's going to be too high. So we need to bound this uh, uh, in this way. Um, and then we're going to get some good training dynamics through a softmax. So even if you don't, even if you don't care about, we don't care that this is a probability in WordDevec, but the training dynamics, which I'll hopefully show you in two slides, uh, are going to be really nice when you use a softmax. Okay, so we take these uh, these inputs that are going to come out of our function, right? So we we projected it into the latent space, reconstructed it back to this, this high dimensional vector, and then we're going to take a softmax over the output of these numbers, right? So we're going to have we're going to exponentiate them all, right? And then normalize them from that, right? Uh, so we can also think about this as projecting onto a simplex. And that's going to give us some good intuition. Um, so if you think about the simplex as this, this triangle, right, right, where each word that we could be predicting is, uh, is a corner, right? Um, and then if we just took these points here, right, like if we took an example of this one, which is A, um, it has nothing to do with word one, right? So word one is zero in this, right? Uh, but it's kind of equally split between word two and word three. Okay, and then if we uh, take a point right in the center, we're going to be equidistant from every word, so it kind of represents every word. We're going to—that's where we're going to be able to minimize the error if the context of this word contains all the other words. And then for this specific vector we're looking at here, um, it's going to show up over here, where we're really strongly word two, with a little bit of a prediction of word one. All right. So how would we interpret this vector in the context of word to vec, like? Given the kind of training dynamics that I talked to you about, what what would you expect um, the the words to look like? Like, wh why would these be similar? And what why is why is word three? Maybe if we think about some examples here, what are some drop-in replacements for word one, word two, and word three? Given the general like English corpus uh, of the way the words we think. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Word one and word two could be uh, days of the week, like Sunday and Monday. Mm -hmm. And word three, like bathroom or whatever that yeah. is related to word one and word two. Yeah, yeah. It's like the it, the context is out of uh, is out of the yeah. They they wouldn't be used in the same context, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and what, what's what's another example? Anyone else? Someone in the back. Someone with a main shirt on. Uh, I see a few. No, Andrew. My brain's fried. <laughs> um, okay, word one could be artificial. Word two could be intelligence. And word three could be bagels. Poutine. Better Poutine. Word. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. So there's some similarity between these words, but they don't share the same context. Um, and I guess we're not looking at what the input word is, so it's a little bit uh, wavy there. Okay, so we can also visualize this to gain even more of an understanding on the kind of training dynamics that you'll see when you're training one of these models. Okay, so we have these levers we can pull at the top, word one, word two, word three, and this is where the model receives a bunch of training examples that maybe says, you need to predict word three. There's a lot of word three in this context, right? So as we're gonna pull towards word three, 
we're going to pull away from word two and word one. Okay? So we're getting some sort of a process of elimination effect given this loss because every single output weight is all tied together given this loss. Right? Even though we're only computing this loss on just the, the two, you know, the, the, few out, the few context words we had for that sample, uh, we're going to be defining the rest of the prediction with that. Okay, so this is going to help a lot with training. Um, okay. Uh, great, great, great. Okay, so, and then when we compute a loss uh, specifically, so a cross, ent or cross entry loss are here, um, just a uh, binary one label loss. Um, we're going we're gonna to be pushing just one value down, right? Um, so we, we take the max here. Um, so we want to um, we want to make um, uh, only the value that we're specifically trying to predict higher, right? So for this, uh, um, we're going to essentially be pulling up the thirteen, right? Which is still going to drive. Uh, so when we pull this up, it drives down the thirteen, and this one's already already super low. So we get this kind of mix of training signal. Okay. Good. Softmax experts. Okay. So now let's look at some some data. Is it super hard to work in research on on, on this stuff? Uh, without data, you can just share um, easily. So there's uh, the open access subset of PubMed Central, and this is uh, a really great resource because you have 1.25 million biomedical articles, right? So all kind of on topic. Um, Two million distinct words. So it's a very big vocabulary. Um, and they're all in XML, so you can you can you can actually say uh, I just want the introduction the introduction section of all the papers, and you don't want to care about the other stuff. And you can parse that out using an XML parser, right? So you can you can really construct uh, uh, your corpus in a very really nice way. Uh, there's not a lot of metadata that's that's enforced, but you do have grouping by journal names, which ends up being really really good. So you can say, well, this has all these papers have to do with arthritis. So you get some information for what those, those words have something to do with, right? So you can use that in other models that you'd want to train. Uh, great. Okay. So on the topic of data, bias is going to be a big issue whenever you train any of these models, right? So what this work did from 2018 uh, is look at if, if you trained uh, a word to vec model on four different you know, corpi that were involving biomedical terms, right? And depending on the data we train it on, our, our model is going to be you know, biased to think that there's a relationship between uh, certain words in one setting and other words in a different setting. OK? Uh, great. So we can look at the results of this model. So that's trained on an a EHR from the Mayo Clinic. Right? So this is a, a doctor or some, uh, somebody in the physician's office is writing a note very technical about a patient and the care given to that patient. Uh, PubMed, so this is going to be extremely technical from the concept of, of the, the scientific research that's going on. Right? So there's going to be words and, and kind of uh, the usage of words that are very different from the EHR. Uh, and then on the other extreme, we have Wikipedia, so it's just like everything, right? Uh, spanning cars, I mean, this, this information is going to be in there. Uh, and then Google News, right? So you can imagine like all the pop articles. Uh, that are about science are going to be in there, right? So you kind of should observe some difference between the, the representations from the words in Google News uh, and the medical records that are written by a physician. So if you look at this first word, so what we're going to be doing is we train these four models, and then we take a specific target word, like diabetes, like yeah, diabetes, and we're going to run it through, project into latent space, and then say, what are the five top, like, matches like we take that vector, we compute a distance to all the words in, a, in the corpus, and we say, what are the five most similar words in that corpus? Okay? This is going to give some bias, because some of these words might not exist in every corpus. Right? But uh, we're going to be able to see, given that data, what we thought were, was like the most similar. Right? So, so the first thing in medical records, uh, you find that they wrote the full name of diabetes in the medical record. Right? But this does not appear uh, in Google News. Right? What does appear in Google News is uh, just diabetics, 
but also hypertension, right? So this is like a correlated, uh, 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 correlated risk, right? So this is something that might appear in a news article. Uh, maybe it'll also appear, appear in the EHR, but that's not the top pick, right? So it's influence in the context of these words. Uh, if we look at peptic ulcer disease and look at the top matches, uh, we find uh, uh, duodenal. So this is a, a type of ulcer, right? So that's maybe the sum the doctor is discussing, maybe other issues with ulcers for that patient. Um, where in Google News we find symptoms of ulcers. Okay. Um, but then stuff like so colon cancer, and here we, we, you know, tokenization is a difficult problem in this data set for the peptic ulcer and for colon cancer, these are individual tokens, right? So this is like a, a challenge for just turning this corpus into something we can work with. Uh, but this is considered a one word. So colon cancer received a single word in bed, a, a single one hot vector. Like it, it, it's not, this is not representing two, po two points that are on. This is representing a single token, right? So that's this caveat, yeah. Uh, which one? In colon cancer, the last word in the first column. Oh, caner? Okay, okay. Oh, it's just a typo. Okay. And yeah, okay. <laughs> but so cancer and cancers um, coexist. Are they being assessed as different tokens? Uh, here, well, so these are from different, uh, uh, each, each column is uh, from a different training set. So they would be treated independently between those training sets. Uh, I would say maybe they should be the same token. I think you want to reduce the number of words you have, but then you can also learn if you had the if your corpus is big enough, and you have enough redundant usage of cancer and cancers, and they really in the, in the context of this corpus they mean the same thing. They're used like interchangeably. Uh, you should see that their their um, their embeddings are almost on top of each other. So we'll see that in the demo um, in, in a little bit. So we'll go back to the word of uh, now. Um, yeah, so let's go back to, well, I guess I'll complete this one slide. So uh, all of them get breast as the uh, thing. Yeah. Uh, question, for the ones with the underscores, are those predefined in some sort of dictionary, or is that learned from some sort of heuristic after seeing two words of pressing, for example, always linked together? Um, I'm not exactly sure, but I think you can find this out from a, like a, an NLP toolkit that will look at the structure of the sentence and then say, this is like a noun, and it's all the stuff in there is the noun. Um, and it might be handcrafted tokens that they get to when they look at some outliers and they put them together. Okay, so let's let's go back and train some more Wordovec. All right, so uh, if everyone got here, we go to vocabulary size. We have 17 words, um, and we can then focus on the last sentence. So here it's like a, just printing out sentence because it's the the last use of sentence in this loop. Right, so we see what, what it was seeing, right? Um, let's compute some indices. I think we need that there. Um, great, so we generated our index pairs as we did in the, uh, the plot, the, the slide earlier. Okay, uh, get input layer, right? So we're gonna um, make one hot vectors here. Define our script grant model as we went over it with a small, um, caveat so we can use it. So different than the slide, we're going to have this reconstruct argument, right? Um, so if we, if we reconstruct, um, then we're going to actually project into two dimensions and project back into the, uh, like the total size of the vocabulary. If we don't do a reconstruction, we're just going to do like just the, the um, embedding part. So we're just going to result, we're just going to return uh, Z one, which is going to be the two-dimensional vector if we had chosen a two-dimensional embedding. Okay. Uh, great, so we can define that. All right, and then this process image function is going to just do uh, some magic where we, we grab all the, represent, all the words in our vocabulary, we project them using our trained uh, Skipgram WordEvec model into two dimensions, and now uh, we're going to uh, take those and plot them in a two-dimensional space. And then if we have it as a function, we can do it over time while it's training, and you can, you can watch the training happen. Right? 
So we can do that. We can get a sample. So now what we're looking at here is the uh, randomized initialization of all the vectors. Right? So each point received a, just random two uh, initial values. And then from there, we're going to have to reconstruct and then use the error to actually train these so they make more sense. OK. So now we'll do this line. This is just deleting the images that have been saved over training. So if you're running this, uh, you want to you want to clean the images folder every time you run it because if you change some hyperparameters, um, it's going to generate. Uh, if, and if you don't train it for the full length of time, because you might want to extend the, the length of time, uh, it's gonna the images you're gonna have issues when you go to make these videos. So let me show that thing initially. So we'll we'll set for the first try, um, 200 epochs, right? 200 iterations um, through all the training pairs. Uh, with a learning rate, it's a very high learning rate of 0 0.1. And then I'm going to start running it. And while it's training, let's go over this code. All right, so for each epic ID, so it's just some number, right, in the range starting from epic 0, that's going to be initialized to 0, to the number of epics, which is 200, uh, we're going to um, create a variable for our, our loss uh, that we're accumulating. We're going to then go over each index pair, right? Um, which is going to be um, our our input word named data, sorry, and the, our target that we're going to predict, which is a specific output, right? So we're going to um, construct this input vector, construct the ground truth label that we want to predict, right? And we're going to run that through the model predicting, uh, writing true as our uh, target uh, to say we're going to, uh, we want to reconstruct. So we want this to be returning the output of this softmax, right? Okay. Uh, then we're going to kind of project this and do the cross entropy uh, given this true label for that single example. And then we'll get a loss, okay? And then we're going to take this, this individual loss and add it uh, to our accumulated loss that we want to keep here, just so we can visualize what the loss is. And then also run a backward pass on the model. Okay? The backward pass is going to compute the gradients that we can then use to update the model to then minimize the error. So we're going to do that in the next line here. So we have this learning rate. And we're going to uh, take our gradient for W1 and W2, multiply it by the learning rate. Right? So we're going to like reduce it here, not that much because it's just 0 0.1, but we're going to reduce this, this uh, correction. Um, and then we're going to subtract that from um, the data of W1. So if you're not familiar with PyTorch, the data is just going to be the, uh, the actual variable representing W1. Okay? And that's, that's our first pass through the model, right? And then we'll like just zero the gradients so we can fill them in next time. OK, so um, we're going to iterate through that tons of times. And you can see at the bottom, it's going to show the loss at epic 0. And then this is the, sum, the sum, summation of all the loss, uh, losses from those reconstructions. And we're going down. And it kind of plateaus around 2 for this model. Uh, and then we get this resulting image, right? Uh, where we can kind of start looking. And hopefully, it works. All right, so if we, you can see queen and king are kind of at the same point, right, where um, I think man is right behind woman there, also goes. But man and woman are also on the same point, given the context. So if you look at the vocabulary, you can kind of see why the embeddings would be learned this way. Uh, and then we can compute a video of this training uh, with these lines, right? And then we can watch. So st we're starting here. This is the initialized set of points. And then we can kind of watch it. First, it's really fast, and it kind of gets set, and then it slowly converges towards um, the, f the correct uh, point. All right, so other things we can do uh, are we can train, change the number of epochs, uh, as well as change words in the context and see how that kind of messes up the word embedding. Um, so let's um, try something here. So let's make the. Uh, the number of epochs uh, maybe longer. So we'll go all the way to 400. 
So we'll just keep computing this. So you can just change that. And because we, we started with epoch here, epoch that still creates, that still has the, the number of the last epoch we were on, right, which is uh, uh, 200. So now we'll run, we'll have it continue training. Uh, so for 200 more epochs, we'll see we kind of went for 200. Um, and we can see that it's, I don't know, kind of bouncing around. Maybe it's starting to go up. It's not too much of a good sign. But we can see what this does in the space. We can visualize it. Um, great. A few more. Is this trending on the CPU or the GPU? CPU. <coughs> How would you in PyTorch? How what? How would you train on the GPU in PyTorch? Uh, well, right now it's really not parallelized at all. It does like one sample per sample. I mean, so in PyTorch you just put everything on CUDA, but then you have to be using matrix operations, which it's not. So there's no um, there's no batch dimension in this. So it's really it's not made. This is not made for the GPU. Um, so you should do really large parallelized batch operations. And then you just do dot CUDA. So you say, like, take, you take your model. I can actually put the model on CUDA now. Um, so if I, if I do, like, torch, no, sorry. Uh, if I do this model here, dot CUDA. And if I ran that, it would return. So I should assign it back to model. Right. Now I just put the model on CUDA. It's that simple. And then you need to take the input weights and put them on CUDA. And then everything it just becomes faster. So because we wrote the module in PyTorch this way, uh, PyTorch knows what the parameters are of this. So it just looked through all the, uh, like the, the, the class fields that are in the skipgram module. And it'll look, it'll find w1 and w2 and say, well, those are obviously parameters. Uh, so I'll, when you call CUDA, it's going to find those and then put them on CUDA for you and I don't have to specify what parts of my model should be on CUDA and which one should not. Um, but this is, this is not made to be efficient. It's made to be easily understood. Um, all right, so we can train this more. We get more of an output, so let's watch the video of this. All right, so the first half up to here is going to be what you saw before. Uh, and then we're going to see if we keep pushing it, what happens to the representation. So it keeps going. You're going to see this more of momentum. And it's slowly going to start rotating a bit. OK. Um, that's not too, too crazy. But one thing we can try to just really mess up this model, let's go change the corpus so it doesn't make any sense. And then we'll see that the word embeddings don't make any sense. So we could change. Um, it's not a human, um, the human goes to space, space. Um, so if we remove relevance for this, um, Right. Uh, now I removed man and woman completely, right? Okay, so then you Okay, so we got some weird this is not correct English now, right? So it doesn't mean anything to us. So let's see if the model can can learn from this, right? So we'll we'll train this model. Alright. So we'll reset the images we took. Let's just do it for 200 epochs, so it's quick. Any more questions? How uh, difficult to scale the model to three or four viewers? Uh, to how, sorry? If I want to match it with uh, three viewers or four viewers, how difficult to scale? Uh, yeah, so your context just uh, uh, becomes 
becomes bigger. So you make the, in here it's a, you have a window size, which I didn't vary yet. Um, so if you increase the window size here, what it's gonna do when it goes to, gra to create each pair, it's going to grab more examples. So here we have really short sentences, so the context can only be so big. Uh, but if you have much longer sentences, you'd want a larger window size. And then it's gonna just grab you know, if your target word, and then you're just gonna have two more examples for every window size you, you, you add. Any particular reason why you're not using uh, natural language kit? Uh, the toolkit, just so it's more simple. You mean the, the natural language toolkit, like the Python? Yes, like collocation, speed graphs, diagrams, all kinds of things. Conditional probability distribution. Uh, no, I don't know what you mean. Uh, natural language toolkit does, for example, a function that shows your collocation. Mm -hmm. Exactly the thing that you do. Mm -hmm. Shows the word that matches the thing. Yeah. Conditional probability distribution will show you how often this pair actually happens uh, okay. in the and so on. So there are some functions that already exist. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is just simple. I think these are other approaches for looking at this, but you'd use those to pre-process the data for this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would use that to tokenize like a large corpus of text, but I want to make the smallest possible example that would work for this, right? So, um, so I didn't add bells and whistles to parse stuff. Although in a moment we're going to parse a larger natural language, uh, like a larger corpus of data, and uh, that could probably use better tools. But here I'm just like taking it really primitive uh, to make a simple example. <coughs> All right, so we have this model probably trained, uh, and the output probably shouldn't make sense anymore. Okay, so king and queen are still here. Space is close to human, person. Woman is close to Germany. All right, so we messed it up a little bit. Right, so it was learning something from the language, and now it's not. Okay. Um, so let's do a few more examples. Okay. So let's talk about another data set that we can then use. So this this small corpus was was okay, uh, but we can work on something that's better. Maybe not as big as the open access subset from PubMed Central, but this smaller. Uh, radiology data set from OpenEye, which is from the uh, University of Indiana, or Indiana University, sorry. So we have these chest x-rays, right, with associated radiology reports, right? And there's, uh, uh, I think this, it says 1,000, uh, but apparently there are 4,000 that we have access to. Uh, and these are completely public. You can just go down and download them from OpenEye. And they are also in XML format, which makes this really nice to work with. Um, so if we take a look at what this, this raw data looks like, uh, you have, uh, let's say, the, the input for a specific radiology report. Looks like this. You have an, an abstract with comparison, indication, finding, and impression. If we look at findings as the section that has the most text, it's like a, you know, manually written uh, by a radiologist, we want to extract all these sequences out of this text, right? Um, so we can... Uh, we can use this code here. So what we're going to do is open up this directory, use this XML library uh, to, to parse all the files, uh, or each, for each file in this directory, parse all, parse, take each XML file, return the tree, right? And then from, from in that XML, we want to like use this, this X path, which is going to find uh, abstract text, which is here, right? With a label that equals findings, right? Here. So we're going to grab that specific, specific attribute. Because here it's a little difficult. There's multiple abstract texts, right? So we just grab the result of that, and then we're going to clean it and add it to our corpus. And that's how we grab this, this data. And their output should be this list here um, of sentences, right? So if you go back to the uh, this Word Devec notebook, and if we grab, if we uncomment out a bunch of lines here. So first let's. Uh, we got to download the data. So if you uncomment out these lines like this, right, and then just run it, it's going to download this file. Uh, hopefully, yeah, I think it finished. Okay, uh, and then if we um, if we parse all these files, we uncomment out this stuff. Uh, 
Okay. We can take a look at what it learned. All right, so grab the first five lines of this. All right, great. So we have none that was there, uh, but also uh, a bunch of sentences that did make it out. Okay. So now this is a, a lot of data. So we can look at the length of this. I can't type. OK. All right, 4,000 reports here. Um, we can visualize it there. OK, so let's start processing it through this. Uh, and we have um, a lot of words in the vocabulary. This should be not all of them. The vocabulary size is uh, 1,600 words. So that's a lot. Um, one issue we could have is that there are words that don't appear often. So these could be useful, but also they could just bog down training for no good reason. So what we can do is only keep the most frequent words as an approach to this, right? So if we um, use this little command here. So here we have um, uh, the counter. Uh, for, for all these words. So if we um, reduce the number of words so that they, they p appear at least 15 times in this corpus, and we'll throw away all the other ones, we can kind of do that with this miracle command here. So if we run this, uh, our vocabulary will be smaller, so 407. So the 407 words occur at least 15 times, so we have a lot of uh, Redundancy. We're going to have a lot of uh, context for these words. All right, we can keep processing this. Okay, and we can look at the uninitialized or the the freshly initialized network, uh, and it's going to be kind of putting all these points everywhere. Right, so there's like a whole whole pile of points, uh, and right now it shouldn't mean anything because they're all random. So if we do see a meaning, a meaning, it's a, uh, it's wrong, uh, or it, it's just luck. So here, let's uh, let's make this a little bit lower because this is going to take a while. I think we should also decrease the learning rate here because we have a lot of examples. Um, so here, if we start running this, it's going to take a lot longer, uh, especially because it's on CPU. And while that's training, uh, I, and is everyone getting this uh, working on their laptop? Who has the uh, radiology reports training now? One, two, three. OK. Some people. OK, good. Well, so I'll, I'll run it here. And also, I think I, we did this, I did this little trick here so it doesn't print out all the time because it takes longer. So if we s just kill it and uh, get rid of this here, we can get more detail. All right. It's still going to take a while to finish each epoch. So while that's training, uh, we, can take, we can look at some pictures at what it looks like when it's finished. OK. So depending on the configuration of the model, we get to look at the, the kind of initialized version, which is going to be a big pile of words. Um, or if our model is going to be you know, not powerful enough to, to model the relationships accurately, to do a good reconstruction, it might fail over just doing a, a compression of the data. Right? And I think that's going to be kind of telltale when you see this, this curve here. So usually when I, I see this, I would imagine it's like failed to capture a lot of meaning. It's just like just trying to grasp on to any kind of um, uh, signal it can to try to reduce the reconstruction error, right? Um, so when you're training these models, uh, if you vary the dimension of the latent space, as was asked earlier, uh, we can then kind of look at what the difference is. So we have uh, a model trained in two dimensions. And we kind of get this, this crescent shape here, right? Um, and we can look at the word spine and then look at the, the words that appear closest to that, right? 
So we have seen evidence, infiltrate, findings, disease, focal, right? Not a lot of uh, meaning here. Uh, but if we change the dimensionality of the embedding space to 100, uh, for one thing, it makes it harder to look at. We can't just visualize it in 2D here. We have to take a TSNI um, of the space to give us like a two-dimensional representation of this high-dimensional vector. Um, but we can look at now where are the neighbors of the word spine, right? And we have spine, severe, changes, interior, mild, also thoracic, right? So maybe these make more sense given the reports that are, that are there. Uh, it's hard to know. Um, but there's some reason that they were chosen as the neighbors, right? So there's some, there's some information that this should be telling us. So let's see if this finished. It still hasn't completed one epoch. Um, all right, so let's. Um, so unfortunately, we are way over time. Uh, and I think that's probably my fault. Um, do you have like a good spot that you could stop the presentation? And, like, yeah, so it's actually, I mean, here is the, the next part of it was RNNs. So this is, I can. I can plot the current, uh, that's how far it got in the training. So it's going to take a while to train on all these words. But there's a freeze. Uh, this is the epic we got to. So, so that's a good idea. <coughs> Uh, like weighting the distance in each dimension. Uh, okay, okay, just based on the distances that, that come. I mean, so if um, if they're all the same distance, you're probably just like looking at a bunch of like some random selections from some 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 space where distance doesn't really mean much. So if you if you see a gradient, so here we see a slight gradient in distance, right? It's high dimension, so the the differences are going to be harder to have, right? But this it goes from three point three to four, right? So it, it learns some way to do that. So if they were all four, like really close to four, I would say maybe it's not, it's not learning anything. Although here it looks like it did this. It's got a nice gradient there, but this could be, um, it's not, not actually learning too much. Uh, Wait, oh, for two, the distance here? Yeah, this is the Euclidean distance between, the po between these points, right? So yeah, yeah it's larger. Um, but for these points, they're, they're all clustered in some, you know, region of this ball, right? So. So the, does the clustering uh, indicate some uh, quality in the, in the structuration of the space? Or uh, the clustering here? Uh, it, what, what I imagine you, would, you should see uh, is are these, l like, little small pockets where things are close. Yeah. And, then, and then some space and then... Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's hard to visualize stuff here because uh, it's high dimensional and then it's Disney. Uh, so you're 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 stuck. Uh, uh, hoping hoping there's some piece of information here. So here it still doesn't look too great with the Disney, but there should be some information stored in there. Great. So I should stop here, or should we take a break? I think maybe in the interest of time. Yeah. Unfortunately, we should stop here and take a five-minute break. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and I think we need to move on to Chris because uh, otherwise we'll be here until midnight. Okay. So thank you very much for that. All right, thank you. And maybe you can leave it on the training to see. Uh, is it still training? I can.
I'll just make it. Yeah. Okay, so when we come back, we'll see how far it's gotten. See what uh, the distances are between the words. And then the last session of the day is going to be Chris Beckham, who's going to show us uh, generative adversarial networks, the uh, interpretability method that I don't understand, but he does. <laughs> I'll try. No, I, I like I said, it's a keynote presentation, and like I, I just prefer my laptop okay. anyway. So yeah, we I need agree. To, I but there, but there is, there, there is an. And I, I, I saw there is a. Okay, so unfortunately, this isn't going to work to visualize. So Andrew, there, there's a backup. If the HDMI doesn't work, there's a VGA to lock into. Okay. Uh, so I'm not worried actually. Good. <laughs> Yeah. I think we're going to skip the rest of this talk first. Because, um... I mean, it gives less time for me, but that's good because it makes me less nervous, so... <laughs> well, you're going to have, like, 40 minutes now? Yeah. Putting your hands on? I, I mean, I mean the, 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 the notebook is pretty brief. It doesn't take a long run, but, I mean, I won't have time to explain it, though, because, I mean... I mean, it's an easy notebook, it's curious and all that kind of stuff, but you still have to explain like what certain things are doing, and so it would be more like, I'm going to run this notebook for you, I'm going to give you a high level overview, but if you have questions about it, you should email me, or slide into my yeah. DMs or something. I mean, so the way I did mine, is I like wrote a bunch of scripts, I didn't go line by line. Yeah. I was like, this is what this block does, Yeah. this is the problem with it, so mm. this is the solution, maybe. Yeah. Because I remember Turns realized, out this isn't a solution. But I had this. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it's because it's a curious demo. Like it's it's not part of just curious. So like it's it's pretty like uh, like the opposite of reverse is pretty brief. However, that could also make people really curious. Like there are some lines of curious. This is my approach. Yeah. But but my point is that whether or not you go part of there's always problems. Yeah. If you go too high level, people get confused. If you go too low level, people get confused. I mean, really, this is an introduction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like... If I, if I knew Joseph was doing his and PyTorch, I would just unmine. Okay, PyTorch. you want to just plug this in, because this is made yeah, yeah, in I'll park, I'll and, uh, I want my computer back. Let's try HDMI first, because at least we get the audio. It's also an audio connection, so... Is that the mic? Oh, the, uh, the, the audio is on a different system. Okay. I, I don't need audio, but... Oh, no, the recording needs audio. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Fuck. Will this work, or will it not work? Oh, it works. That is... Yes. 
You're gonna have to do this, so if you can do this, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go home now. There's a Tasmanian devil, I think, and uh, <laughs> Tasmanian detective, something about distributions. Oh, yeah, there was, yeah, yeah, I still, I still, I still have the cartoons in there, but like, they kind of, I don't know, it doesn't make it too juvenile, I don't know. I forgot, I forgot the other guy's called, though, the detective, the bunny, someone, someone had to tell me his name, 
OHP him because I forgot his name. I don't care. It's inconsequential. Okay. Let's get it started because, uh. Yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's get this over with. 40 minutes. I mean, 40 minutes. take your time. I'm so excited. Nah, you've already seen Every it. Day. I don't need to take my time. You've seen it. No, no, the new shit. I'm looking forward to the new stuff. Not much new. I heard it was better. The hands on demo. Bigger, better, bigger, better, faster, stronger. <clears throat> Yeah, I guess. I guess. Oh, we'll just. Oh, you got your Instagram on here. <laughs> yeah, no, I was gonna make a joke about that. Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh, yeah. I won't say anything else. Do you, do you have Insta? Did you put your Instagram? I do, but it sucks. My Twitter is much better. Yeah. I'm, I mean, like, you, you get real pro of taking like pictures of your iPhone after a while. Like, trust me, you just gotta know. How to you do got it. so many like professional shots at the Borealis <laughs> booth and at the, uh, the Nvidia party. Yeah. You had like a <laughs> nah, it's, it's all it's all about processing, man. It's about how to turn crap photos into good ones. Okay, guys. So, last session of the day. Um, Christopher Beckham gave a great intro to GAN's uh, presentation at the Organization for Human Brain Mapping. He's updated his presentation with new cartoons, new probability distributions. I don't even know. I haven't seen it yet. Um, he is a research associate at Mila, maybe, yep. starting PhD soon. State of the art, we went from back propagation, generative adversarials uh, networks are like one of the more exciting things happening in the space right now. And we've got one of the leading experts who is gonna tell us about it right now. Such a so, flattering intro, thank you. Christopher Beck. So I just want to say before I start, um, you know, GANs, uh, I mean, it's what we call generative adversarial networks, we just abbreviate to GANs. Um, they were very trendy a long time ago. They're still trendy, but I'm, I just want to say uh, that deep reinforcement learning is the, uh, is the trend now in our lab. So, uh, but yeah, it's okay. Um, so yeah, my name is Chris. Uh, I'm giving a talk on uh, GANs. Uh, and so, I mean, really this kind of falls under a class of, uh, you know, there's a whole class of unsupervised learning techniques. And so generative adversarial networks, these are, as the name suggests, these are generative models. Uh, and so basically they're models where you're trying to learn the data uh, in an unsupervised manner, you're trying to learn the data through learning how to generate the data. And so if you've ever heard this quote by Richard Feynman, um, and, uh, I, what's it, I, what I cannot create, I do not know. That's kind of related. That's a very fitting one. Um, so yeah, uh, you can follow me on GitHub, Twitter, or Instagram. <laughs> so what are generative adversarial networks? Um, so like I said, there are a class of algorithms used in unsupervised learning where the goal is to learn implicitly the data distribution. Uh, so what do I mean by the data distribution? Well, you go out and you collect data, and maybe you, you go out and you collect like uh, tens of thousands of pictures of cats, and you can think of there being like a cat distribution. But I mean, really, this is just a statistical metaphor. I mean, that's my face too close to the mic. It's really just a statistical metaphor. Um, really, by the data distribution, in more pragmatic terms, we just mean the universe. So like it's kind of like we're sampling from the universe. Um, and so the way we train GANs is that we do it through two networks, uh, two adversaries. One is called a generator, and one is called a discriminator. Uh, and they compete to outdo each other. Um, I'll explain what both of these do in a second. Uh, and so ideally, this game, this training game, finishes when uh, no network uh, is able to outperform the other and so they've kind of like they're competing trying to one-up each other and they kind of reach this equilibrium um, and I'm not going to go into this but it's, it suffice to say that you can sort of analyze GANs in a very theoretical way and it basically amounts to doing uh, like minimizing a distance between two distributions and so you know it may seem kind of gamey and weird but, but there are theoretical foundations um, so that's good if you like math 
Uh, so really, uh, I'm going to give an example here of like the Mona Lisa painting. This is just a real kind of uh, hopefully simple example of how this all works. Uh, you have a guy called a discriminator and he's kind of like the detective and his job is to basically detect, uh, the, uh, distinguish fake paintings of Mona Lisa from real paintings. Uh, so he's wondering with his magnifying glass, is it real or fake? Uh, and then you have this Tasmanian devil dude, this real uh, <laughs> evil dude called the generator. And he's going to produce a fake, uh, but it's not going to be a very good fake because you can see it's blurry and all that so, uh, sort of stuff. And so the discriminator is going to be able to easily distinguish it. But over time, the generator is going to try to uh, basically exploit flaws in this guy's thinking, uh, eventually sort of iter iteratively produce uh, a more realistic painting such that it fools this detective, the discriminator. Um, sorry. I press too many keys. Um, and so really, uh, you know, to kind of make this more concrete, uh, the way you sort of code up this generator is that you have this thing called a, um, a prior distribution. And so a prior distribution is really just a simple distribution that you can sample from. It could be a, a Gaussian, it could be a uniform. And in this case, it's actually a two-dimensional distribution. So it, it's a, it's a two-dimensional uniform distribution. And the idea is that the generator is actually a mapping from a noise source. So when you sample from this uniform distribution, it's really just a, a it's a cube of noise essentially. Uh, and you sample a Z and you'll run it through this function G and it's gonna uh, produce a sample in the space of the data, right? So the space of the data in this case, if you're generating uh, 200 by 200 pixel images, then this would be you know a, a very high dimensional space. Uh, so yeah, I'm just putting this X there. Uh, so we can say we can model arbitrary distributions, uh, you know, complicated distributions like the distributions of images uh, by sampling from a simple distribution, which is called the prior. And then we're going to map the sample through a sufficiently powerful function, uh, which is G. And that's going to be a deep neural network. So this is really uh, one half of how GAN works. This is how the generator uh, produces samples. You just, you got to feed it some noise, a uh, source of entropy, and then it produces um, a sample in the space of the data. And this can be images or audio or, or whatever you're interested in. Um, so here's another way of looking at it. This is, I guess, just a more kind of concrete example. You have some random noise. In this case, you feed it through a generator. Um, and this is really just the inverse of a convolutional neural network. So rather than convolving down into a smaller spatial dimension, you're actually sort of doing a transpose convolution. And so this kind of maps from a noise source and eventually it, it produces an image. <coughs> Uh, this is also called a deconvolutional network, although I think that uh, is less correct, but it's good to say it's a transposed uh, convolution. Um, and so I'm just going to use this notation here. Um, so when I write this like this, I'm just saying Z is a sample, is a draw from P of Z. And so P of Z is the prior, uh, like a uniform distribution or a Gaussian or, or what have you. Um, I also might write this, uh, so X2 which is like the generated sample uh, is G of uh, G of Z. Um, by the way, if you have any questions or anything, um, you know, d don't hesitate. You can sort of butt in. I don't, I don't like these things to be too formal. So, you know, d don't, don't hesitate. Um, so I'm going to basically schematic out uh, how, uh, you know, in full, how a GAN is trained. And then I'm going to sort of create some pseudocode from that. Uh, so the idea is that uh, in this presentation, oh, sorry, in this slide, um, I'm sort of denoting this box to be a generator. I'm using a box to kind of sort of conceptualize. You kind of feed it some noise and you turn the crank and you get a sample. And so you sample some noise uh, Z from P of Z. You're going to put it through this box and turn the crank uh, and you're going to get some images. And so in this case, I'm using uh, images of digits. So we're going to try to generate endless digits. Uh, and so the discriminator, so when you, when you train the GAN, you're training the discriminator and the generator. Uh, and so when you train the discriminator, you're going to sort of feed this fake data uh, to this network. And then it's going to try to minimize this loss. And so D, so D of X or D of this, uh, it basically uh, it outputs a probability. Uh, so from zero to one, uh, and that probability is a probability of how, uh, how real the image is. And so the discriminator, he's going to try to, uh, it's going to try to, uh, minimize this loss, right? So it, so it wants D of G of Z, uh, which is, this is X tilde, it wants D uh, of G of Z to be as close to zero as possible, right? So it's like 0% real, which is fake. 
um, and then it's going to try to minimize its loss and it's going to back prop uh, through it. So it's going to update its parameters so as to minimize its loss. And here you have a sample uh, from the training set, or you can say it's a sample from the data distribution if you like to think of sampling from some, some space. Um, and then uh, it's going to be fed into the discriminator and it's going to do the opposite, right? So it's one, it wants to minimize uh, this Euclidean distance, d of x minus 1. Right, so it wants d of x to be one, which means like 100% real. Um, and then it's gonna back prop and, and update its parameters. Right, so basically it's trying to assign sort of high probability to real and low probability to fake. Um, and so the generator is gonna try to do the opposite now. So you're gonna sample some noise and the generator is gonna produce something. But what it's gonna do now is that it's actually gonna feed its, its sample to the discriminator and the generator is actually going to try to minimize this loss right so d so in this case d when the discriminator was trying to do this it wanted uh, d of the fake sample to be zero and now the generator wants to do the opposite it wants it to be one and so essentially it's trying to update its parameters so as to fool the discriminator um, and that's that's pretty much uh, what goes on when you train a game uh, so the discriminator does one thing and the generator is going to try to do the opposite thing and they're going to sort of iteratively uh, sort of compete. Uh, and so we can kind of uh, summarize this into an algorithm. Uh, we can say let D denote the discriminator with uh, D of X outputting a, a probability. It, it technically doesn't have to be a probability, but in this particular algorithm, it's a probability. Uh, and so D wants to do the following things. Uh, for the real X, that is the X that comes from the training set, uh, it wants to update its parameters so as to minimize um, some loss between d of, z, uh, d of x and 1. And so L in this case would just be like a binary cross entropy. For g of z, which is fake x, uh, update its parameters so as to minimize uh, this distance between d of g of z and 0. Right? So 1 is real and 0 is fake. G wants to do the following. It wants to update its parameters so as to minimize uh, the distance between d of g of z and 1. So it's the opposite of this, right? So, and so L, like I said, is some distance function. Uh, in this particular algorithm, uh, um, well, actually, uh, the, from the slides earlier, it's actually it was it was a squared squared error, but it doesn't have to be squared error. It could be binary cross entropy. It could be uh, uh, any almost any distance function. Uh, so yeah, if you use binary cross entropy, then this becomes a JS scan. Uh, this is just a technical, uh, you, you'll, you'll hear about a lot of GANs in the literature, like Jensen Shen GAN, Wasserstein GAN, uh, but they're all very similar, they just use a different loss function. Um, so anyway, so I'm going to answer some kind of questions in case you, I'm sure you're wondering the same thing, like what is actually the sort of use of this? Um, so, so, you know, what's the use of learning to generate data? Well, the first thing is that you may actually want to generate or augment data. Um, so I try to provide a funny example of, uh, this is like a style transfer. You, you have a Shiba and you have a painting and you try to uh, you know, make this look like this is the artist's painting. I know like maybe in a neuroscience context, it's not so, uh, not so useful, but, um, but I'm gonna sort of provide uh, both sides of the story because it, it can actually be useful to do these sorts of things. Um, so some examples is like in painting images. And so the idea is that uh, you can actually use GANs to infill images and so if you have an image which has some occluded regions, uh, you can train a GAN, and so this is, this is the final result. And so in this case, um, the input to the GAN wouldn't be like a, a noise vector that you sample from a prior. The input to the GAN would just be this image, right? So, you, so GANs can map from images to images and, and other things. They don't have to map from uh, noise samples to images or what have you. Um, this is uh, attribute transfer. So right, if you have a certain input image, you can do things like you can have the GAN uh, do attribute transfer, like you want to give this guy blonde hair or change his gender or make him older, you can do that. Um, here's actually music generation uh, with GAN, so I'm going to play that. You, I don't think you'll hear it though. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. What happened here? Generated video sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. okay, we're good. We're good. It's probably just a, a sensitive. Uh, yeah. So this is this is really the uh, 
So I was asking the question, what's the use of learning to generate data? And this is probably the, the more appropriate answer in this context, because I mean, it's nice to you know, generate paintings and stuff, but this is really the thing that is most important. Uh, learning to generate data can actually help you learn better representations, right? And so I'm gonna go back to this quote by Richard Feynman, uh, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And so I was saying at the start of the presentation, uh, in unsupervised learning, right, there are like dozens of algorithms that you can use for this, but the sort of the, the paradigm the sort of point of view that Gan takes is that you know we, we can learn we can learn uh, factors we can learn interesting things about the data if we learn how to generate it. Uh, so I mean I'm gonna sort of uh, you know put all Thomas Bayes up here and, and, and put Bayes rule and so uh, you can think about maybe you you have a classifier and you want to learn p of y given x and so you want to maybe predict a label given x where you can decompose this into uh, you know, p of x and y, the, the joint of x and y, and p of x is in a denominator. Uh, but you can see that these are sort of, uh, these are linked, right? So if you could, say, improve your estimate of p of x, or your sort of implicit estimate, because often you can't estimate this in the first place, it's intractable, but if you can, in some sense, improve this, then it will also improve this, right? So when, when I um, when I talk about semi-supervised learning, I, I like to use this as an example. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna give an example now on semi-supervised classification. Uh, maybe you have some data here that this is labeled data. Uh, this is like a real simple example where you have like one data point per class, but you, know, you have one point in this white class and one point in this black class. And I mean, in supervised learning, you just say, well, I'm gonna put a decision boundary between them. But you know, what if you have all this unlabeled data here? Because if you knew that this existed, then you could infer maybe this was the decision boundary. Uh, but if you just use uh, supervised learning algorithms, supervised only learning algorithms, then you're not actually going to be able to leverage this data. Right, so I mean, this is what semi-supervised learning is all about. Uh, you might have a big data set, but maybe uh, most of the examples don't have labels because labels are costly to obtain. You think about like, uh, you know, segmentations and how expensive they are to, uh, to annotate. Um, so here's an, I, I'm going to explain all this, I, this is probably a bit much, but um, this is a, uh, a semi-supervised architecture. So this is kind of similar to that uh, sort of digit generation we were doing earlier. And so we have a discriminator here. Well, actually I'll explain this part first. So, you know, this is the same, we have a generator which maps uh, noise samples to, um, to, to samples in, in the data distribution. And, you know, this goes through a discriminator and a discriminator classifies whether it's real or fake. Um, but what we could do is that we could also make the discriminator the classifier, right? So it has two jobs. It, it basically, on this output here, it has to predict whether it's real or fake, and it also has to predict uh, what digit it is from zero to nine. So this is a hybrid architecture. It actually does both things. Uh, and so what's cool is that this is, this is semi-supervised because it means that if you have some labeled examples, maybe like 200 or 500 of them, you can use them, right? But if you have like maybe 50,000 unlabeled examples, you can still use them. So you can actually combine labeled and unlabeled data in the training. You know, if you have labeled data, you just kind of, you run a, the, the, a supervised loss on this part. And if you don't, you just detect whether it's real or fake. So this would be an example of using a GAN um, to basically do semi-supervised learning. So to make it kind of more applicable, maybe in, in medical and neuro, you might do something like segmentation and you, know, you could think about how you could adapt this architecture to, uh, to say, improve segmentation. I'll leave that as an exercise to you guys, although there are papers out there that do this and I, I strongly suggest you read them. Um, another example is uh, autoencoders. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with autoencoders, but really it's just a, a deep learning, deep learner, uh, deepified version of PCA essentially. Uh, you have your uh, original input, uh, you run it through an encoder, and this bottleneck is basically, this, it's a compressed representation. Um, and you, from that compressed representation, you run it through a decoder and you get the original input back. And we want this to be compressed because we want to, to uh, force the autoencoder to learn the things that most matter. So we're not gonna make it a, a huge bottleneck, we're gonna, we're gonna compress it. Um, and so the way you train an autoencoder is that you basically minimize the Euclidean distance between X uh, and the, the decoder of the encoder of X, right? So that's just the reconstruction. Um, 
but you know it's been well established that uh, Euclidean distance is actually a terrible perceptual similarity metric and so if you've ever seen autoencoders uh, on say natural images you'll find that the outputs are pretty blurry so I mean they're kind of decent but they're not state-of-the-art by any means uh, but it turns out what you could do is that you could Ganify this and so now this reconstruction you basically try to fool the discriminator and so the discriminator is trying to distinguish between real images and reconstructions which are fake right and so now the autoencoder is the generator and it's got two uh, objectives it has to minimize this reconstruction error this euclidean distance uh, and it also has to fool the discriminator and so if you do this uh, this is from a, a paper that came out a few years ago if you just have a regular autoencoder you get these blurry samples but then if you combine the autoencoder and the GAN, you actually get more crisp samples. Um, so which is nice. So you can actually use GANs to, to actually um, produce a better reconstruction, which will in turn uh, produce better latent features in the, in the bottleneck. Um, so there's this thing I want to mention. Uh, it's called the manifold hypothesis. This is something that's quite central in, in deep learning. Um, you know, when we train deep neural networks, we're trying to, to figure out this thing called a manifold. Um, and so if you take the space of, say, uh, 128 by 120 images that are RGB, uh, the entire space of images is 255 to the power of this, which is an extremely large number. I, I couldn't calculate it on Google, so I'm, I didn't put it here. Um, but really, you know, even though that's the space, not, not all natural images lie in that space, right? Like, uh, well, what I mean is that if, if this was that, that space, this 255 to this big exponent, I mean, most of it's just going to be like gibberish right but you know images that actually look real like this like in this case it's, it's pictures of faces they will lie on this kind of manifold so we say that the real data lies on uh, lies on a low dimensional manifold in a high dimensional space um, and so that's really what we're trying to recover uh, when we train deep nets yeah Um, well, we imagine it would be. I think. Well, when we when we train deep nets and and sort of look at the latent representations, they. I mean, the sort of the better trained it is, the bigger the data set, the smoother it is, basically. Yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, so how does this relate to GANs? Well, uh, when you when you train a GAN and you look at the the prior distribution, the space of the prior, you know, even though it's just a simple distribution that we sample from, you can actually interpolate along that space. Right, so this is kind of related in some sense. So if this is the Z space, so just imagine this was like a, I mean, of Jordan an ellipsoid, but just imagine it's like a, a two-dimensional cube, right? So just a rectangle. Um, you know, you might have a point here Z1, and maybe when you feed Z1 to the generator, you get like a dog. Maybe when you feed Z2, you get like a train. And it turns out that if you were to do a convex combination, so if you were to do a linear interpolation between uh, these two you actually get this interesting uh, warp here, uh, right? So, um, and so this is what happens when you kind of successfully train again, when you train it for long enough, you can kind of do these weird interpolations uh, and produce like really hallucina hallucinogenic videos. So I'm gonna, so I'm just gonna say that the space of the prior becomes uh, semantically meaningful, which is really the key thing. So I have a video to show. So this is actually a state-of-the-art GAN that, that came out like a, a few weeks ago. Uh, trained on really high-resolution natural images. By the way, this probably takes like months to train, so so don't bother. <laughs> uh, but no, this, so yeah, this this came out a few weeks ago, and um, it's called Big Gan, uh, and so it's just uh, you know, there's all these like really ambitious people out there who have been trying to do this for uh, for natural images. So this, I think, this is the ImageNet data set. Um, uh, anyways, so this, how are we doing for time, Andrew? You got 15 minutes. Oh, I could I could run through the demo. I've got I've got a notebook, so um, but but. Anyway, this concludes the, uh, the presentation. Uh, so like I said, I, I realize um, you know, this is probably, um, maybe for most of you, this is kind of a new thing. And um, 
you know, it, it's, it can be in some senses so, so far removed from other things in deep learning. And so, you know, if you have any questions, uh, you know, don't hesitate or you can just email me, it's fine. Um, I, I, think, I think this has sort of a great utility in, in, in medical because of this problem, right, with uh, getting labeled data. If we can somehow use unlabeled data to kind of help build better models, then I think, I think this is the direction that we want to go in. Um, so this is a, a Keras example on how to train again. I will try my best. I haven't used Keras in a long time. I actually use PyTorch, but you know, that's not a problem. Um, now, because I only have 15 minutes, I'm not gonna be able to explain everything in great detail. Um, but you know, you, you can, you know, don't hesitate to email me or ask questions after. Um, but I'm just gonna give a, a high level overview and, and we're gonna train a, a GAN on MNIST. And hopefully it's not gonna take like too long and then hopefully by the end we'll, we'll have some digits that we can sample. Um, so, slightly blurry, but I guess you guys can kind of see that. Um, Do you want to command plus or something? So yeah, yeah, that's true. I'll try to command. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so in this notebook, we, we're going to train this thing called a least squares GAN. Um, and so a least squares GAN is just a GAN where essentially the loss function uh, is, is that sort of mean squared error, if you remember that from the slides. Um, but there are really like, you know, dozens of them and, and they all use different loss functions. They, they kind of, I'm not going to say they all do the same thing because theoretically some are better than others, but, but for this presentation, uh, it doesn't matter. So we're just going to do some imports. Uh, we're importing some Keras layers and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, this is a CPU, although you can change it to GPU. Oh, actually, I think it's GPU already. Yes. That's great. Okay. <laughs> uh, so this is the GAN architecture. So remember, we're gonna sample some noise. And in this case, it's gonna be something like, I think it's a 128 dimensional Gaussian noise. Uh, and we're gonna have a generator that's like this. Uh, this is actually a convolutional, uh, a transpose convolutional generator. We're actually just gonna use an MLP. So it's just a fully connected neural network. Um, but yeah, this is basically the schematic. Um, and so we're gonna define a generator and it's gonna be a, an MLP, which maps from the Z dimension, which is like, I think 128 or something. And it's gonna go through these, uh, these fully connected layers and it's gonna output uh, a 28 by 28 image since that's the dimension of MNIST. And so we're just gonna run that. And so really it's just, you know, uh, fully connected ReLU uh, batch norm. I don't know if you guys got taught batch norm, but you know, you just plug it in. Uh, so it's just dense ReLU batch norm, dense ReLU batch norm. Uh, and so we're going to build a discriminator and so the discriminator is going to take a 28 by 28 image and it's going to run it through, sorry, it's going to run it through sort of multiple layers and the output's just going to be one dimension. So this is, uh, well, because it's a least squares scan, it's not a probability, but it's still going to output zero and one. So, you know, that's fine. Uh, so we're going to build the discriminator. Uh, we're going to load the MNIST data set. Yes, that's done. And we're just gonna visualize uh, some, of the, some of the samples. All right, so pretty simple. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into all this, but I'm just writing uh, um, the, the loss function here. And so the discriminator is trying, so we're, we're kind of iterating over the data set. And so for the real samples, we're gonna minimize the distance between D of X, I, and one. So that's real. And then for the fake, which is D of G of Z, we're gonna make it zero, right? So this is classifying real and classifying fake. And the generator is gonna do the opposite. So it wants uh, D of G of Z uh, to, hold on, is that correct? This should be one. I'll, I'll fix that later. Um, and so what you do is that you uh, define the optimizer and we're just gonna use Atom. Uh, we're gonna build the discriminator. We're gonna sort of print the summary of the discriminator. Uh, and then we're just going to compile it with this loss function. Um, I, I realize that, you know, sort of in, in some sense, Keras might be a bit too abstract. I mean, I'm just specifying loss equals mean squared error. And, you know, somehow that magically does what I, I say here. So I apologize for this. Um, but maybe, I think maybe tomorrow I could sort of make this so that it's more explicit that we're actually implementing this loss here. Um, but anyways, it's not too hard to do. So I'm going to run that. Uh, and so we, we get some kind of description of what the network is. Um, so 
So do I have time to do this? So yeah, same thing here. Actually, the Z dimension is 100. We're going to build the generator. We're going to print a summary of it. Uh, and then we're just going to define some input. So we're going to say that Z is the input uh, to the generator with this dimension. Um, and then we kind of have to do this little trick here. Um, maybe for the paper, uh, sake of time, I, I won't go into that, but I mean, I, I can explain it. But essentially, we're just setting up uh, the generator and discriminator so that they train separately. Um, well, you know, alternating, I should say. But we will just run this. Um, and now I'm going to train it. I'm not going to let it run for at least 10 minutes. I'll just let it run for maybe five and we'll just run that. So if you have any questions uh, like regarding anything else, I mean, now would be a good time since this is going to try. Yep. Mm -hmm. So norm normally it's a one-to-one. -one. I mean, so it's just like, it, it doesn't matter which one starts first, but it's generator, discriminator, generator, discriminator. Uh, so some recent formulations, what they do is that they actually train a discriminator more often than the generator. So you might say train a discriminator five times, train a generator once, train a discriminator five times, but but that's a good question. Um, five times, you mean five batches? Yeah, yeah, five, five, yeah, five mini batches, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so nowadays it's pretty common to do like a five to one ratio because, um, so I'll, I'll give like a slight history lesson. Um, a very long time ago when you train GANs, you had to do this like silly black magic where essentially if the discriminator got too powerful, the generator couldn't leverage good gradients from the, from the discriminator. And so during training, you'd actually intentionally have to cripple both the networks. So you wouldn't want one network to be way more powerful than the other, right? And so, so I mean, when you train this, you kind of have to do the same thing. You have to you have to make sure that the discriminator loss is not too low relative to the generator loss. And you know, that sounds a bit like black magic, it sounds finicky, it sounds annoying, and I agree with you. Um, but sort of recent development in GANs, um, people have found ways to, to kind of uh, apply regularization, good regularization to the discriminator. And so nowadays when you train a GAN, you actually wanna train it uh, for, for uh, like a five to one ratio or a 10 to one ratio is really good. Because like the more you train a discriminator, the higher quality the gradients that the generator gets, right? So what, so what I'm showing here is kind of like the old school way of doing it, but I mean, uh, you know, state of the art GANs, they're very easy to train. So you don't have to worry too much about, uh, you know, black magic or anything. And what about the uh, oh, yeah. uh, distance of moving out? Yeah, yeah, so Washerstein is, uh, I actually mentioned it at, at the bottom here. So Washerstein, uh, the Washerstein GAN I really like because so another thing I haven't mentioned is that when you when you train again, right, you kind of have to, it's not clear when you actually converge because you have a discriminator loss and you have a generator loss and you have to try to like balance them. But with a Washerstein GAN, you can actually look at the Washerstein distance and as it goes down, it, it, it's highly correlated with sample quality. And so usually when it goes down, it means that your samples get better. Um, and so Washerstein GAN is actually uh, one of the state of the art formulations. Um, but there was this theoretical development that happened recently where, where people were basically saying it doesn't matter so much what kind of GAN that you use, what's most important is regularization on the discriminator. And so if you take the original GAN, which came out in 2014, it's, it's extremely unstable. If you apply the right regularization to the discriminator, it becomes state of the art. And so <laughs> it's like, okay, all these formulations that people have come up with, they don't really mean that much anymore. Uh, so what's, what's important is, is, is right regularization um, and there are a few techniques to do that. So, yeah. sorry, did you have a question in the back? So, I understand this is a way of recreating data noise. Uh -huh. Are people using this to create like synthetic data sets? Yep, you could actually. I mean, you, you could, in theory, uh, use this to synthetically generate data and then use that to help train a classifier. Now, that sounds a bit weird at first, but I, I think as long as you have like a, an evaluation metric, to determine like you know accuracy for example then then it's it, that's a good thing to do i think yeah so absolutely so data uh, data augmentation and generation yeah yeah um no it's simple noise is fine actually um like usually people use like a uniform or gaussian noise but i mean it's it's really you can use anything right like like i said with gans you don't necessarily have to map from noise to images you can map from images to images you can map from audio to audio noise to audio um 
It's, it's just really just some source of entropy that you can use to, to run through a, a complicated function. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean that's the ideal situation is that it's kind of, um, I think that in theory they call it like a Nash equilibrium, but, but yeah, it, 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 I think uh, sort of ideally what happens is that, uh, that it becomes 0.5, and so the generator is sort of not better than the discriminator, and the discriminator is not better. Yeah. So does it happen? Uh, sometimes it does, yeah. But I mean sometimes, um, you know, even if you don't reach that equilibrium, you still might get good samples from the generator, and so at that point you can say, like, I'm, I'm good. You know, and that's fine. Yeah. Although, although it's worth noting that there's, there's been a lot of really complicated theory that goes into GANs, and, and you know, some people say that uh, depending on the GAN that you use, it doesn't actually quite hit an equilibrium, it oscillates around it. And so I'm not really a GAN theoretician, but there's uh, so much literature out there trying to explain the dynamics of GAN training. And because of this alternating game, it actually makes the analysis really complicated because it's like a moving target, essentially. Yeah. Used to help GANs to converge and not like generate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to avoid generate, degenerate. De degenerate solutions, exactly. Um, yeah. So people have been like using, uh, introducing some noise in the input and in the image that are generated. Some people have been using like uh, noise in the others. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, yeah, so I mean really it just goes down to regularization. Um, it, it's just like in, in a normal sort of, you know, when you do like a normal deep learning thing, you, you try not to make your network overfit. It's the same thing for the discriminator. So there are all these tricks that people have done like label smoothing and all that. Um, it, it's actually, they're quite sort of outdated now. The, the two most up-to-date tricks that people use, one's called gradient penalty. So that basically, uh, it basically, well, you know, you can relate it back to like Lipschitz functions. It's, it stops the, so the function that the discriminator learns, it stops it from kind of, you know, it makes it a bit smoother. And the other one is spectral norm. Uh, so that, that basically regularizes the, the spectral norm of the matrix. Um, but I mean, really, you know, these techniques, they, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, they just kind of stop it from overfitting too fast. So you can think about it, it's in the same, you know, league of things like, uh, you might do like weight decay when you're training a classifier. So that would be another thing that you could use. Although I don't know if it, if it works well for GANs, but just you know, anything to kind of constrain the, the discriminator such that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't learn too quickly, overfit too quickly. Because when it overfits and the generator tries to kind of get gradient from the discriminator, there are kind of issues um, and things like that. Uh, it's, it's used both, right? So in the, in the training, um, yep, yep. So you sample some noise, you feed it uh, to generate it, and then the discriminator gets it. So yep, it's it's both training and test time. Um, all right. So if I just bring this up again, um, yep, yep. So in that latent Z space, uh -huh. how would you condition it? Like I've seen some cool work where you force a network to, mm -hmm. an individual neuron learns maleness and femaleness, and if you or flip that from one to zero, you end up like being able yeah. to generate the yep. female version of a... Yeah, so, so uh, I guess the most straightforward way to do it is actually, I, I didn't mention this, but when you have a generator, which is, uh, right, so right now it's only conditioned on Z, you can actually, condi so if you have labeled, uh, say for example, you have like some, the Celebrity A data set, right? And you have like 200,000 images of celebrities and you have like uh, binary attributes for all of them, like blonde hair, male, female, uh, you know, old, young. You condition the generator on the label. So now it's G of Z and Y. Right? And so what that does is that it, it actually does this disentanglement, right? So you can have a Z and you can give it different Ys, right? And so what you can do, so like with one Z, if I feed like the latent code for female, it's gonna produce a female version of that person. And then if I turn on the, the code for like say black hair, it's gonna do it. And so that's probably the easiest thing you can do. Um, there was a, a project that I, I saw recently on GitHub where a, a guy just used a, an unsupervised GAN 
and he did some tricks to try to figure out what each so say it's like a 128 dimensional latent code sorry uh, the prior the vector he tried to figure out using like a linear regression what each uh each dimension uh, stood for mm. right so that, that was kind of more like let's do an exploratory analysis of a of a gan that's trained in an unsupervised manner but yeah that's that's a good question okay i'm gonna i'm gonna stop this training now and see if it uh did it, oh it finished oh cool okay uh hopefully they look good um so i'm just defining a function to to sample images um and, and so you can see here like what i'm doing is that um I, i'm just um sampling okay in this case the noise is coming from a, a normal distribution so it's just a you know um how to say it? it's a it's a it's a hundred dimensional uh gaussian where all the dimensions are independent so it's like a just a diagonal covariance and then i'm going to run that through the generator so generator dot predict noise and then i'm just going to plot it okay so it could have trained for longer because it's a bit grainy but you can see that uh that's mostly spot on when it comes to generating digits sometimes it just produces crap but if you train it for longer it'll it'll, it'll get better um and so what you can do is that you can interpolate between these z values so this is what i uh that's what Andrew just mentioned. So I'm sampling a, a Z1 and a Z2, and they're both from this Gaussian. Um, and then I can, well, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna display both of them. Actually, let me just do another one. I want, I want pretty digits. No. Ah, that's good enough. So it's, it's an eight and a five. And then what we're gonna do is we, we're gonna interpolate along a line. So we're, we're gonna plot, so, so we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna compute A times Z1 plus one minus A times Z2, where A is gradually increased from zero to one. So it's just a convex combination. Um, it doesn't have to be a convex combination. It could be, um, there are other ways to do interpolations, like in our polar coordinates, uh, but we're just gonna do that. Uh, and you can see it's actually learned the smooth interpolation between a five and a slightly bunged up eight. Uh, but yeah, and so uh, just to kind of conclude, I, I just wrote some text here. I, I guess you know some of you guys actually asked really good questions, but I was just saying that you know where to go from here, uh, and that you know you should look at these other techniques uh, like Wasserstein GAN. Um, I, I didn't present it because it's slightly more complicated in terms of how you set that up, but um, you know this would make your life a whole lot easier than uh, the GAN that I'm using right now, uh, and also gradient penalty, which is just a trick that you use to to uh, perform. Uh, regularization on the discriminator. Um, I should really expand this section. There's there's a lot more I could write, but um, but you know that kind of concludes it anyway. Um, you know, let me know. Uh, you know, you can talk to me after, or, or just write me an email if there's anything you're unsure about uh, in the notebook. I'm happy to get back to you. Yep. Put some uh, Zs in that are really far away from the Goshen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. So, like a ten. Like a ten thousand. What's gonna happen? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's actually still kind of like, yeah. <laughs> deep learning. <laughs> Hashtag deep learning. Uh, okay, let, let, but let's do something crazy. Let's let's just like let's just move it away from. Yeah. Uh, let's, I guess we also could have just increased the variance. Actually, yeah, we'll try both of them. So wait, what about, let's just, I think I just do the almost same thing, but like what if I just do like really crazy variants? Nah. Uh, okay, I, I was expecting it to, uh, but I mean, in, in general, uh, if you go too far off to prior distribution, you expect to, to get gibberish. Um, yeah. Cool. Okay, I think we might have to all give Chris a round of applause. So it's five minutes over. I'm sorry. It's better than I did. <laughs> so I just wanna I just wanna say thank you, um, thank you to Thomas for his excellent uh, segmentation tutorial. Uh, to Joseph for his word to vec uh, intro and hands-on, to Chris for uh, getting us all the way up to the state-of-the-art 
Chris is the one who told me about group norm, and I literally, literally added it to my slides last night, and now I have to figure out spectral norm. This is like maybe going a little too fast. <laughs> um, and finally, thank you to all of you for, uh, for staying to the end. And, uh, and I hope you get, had got something valuable out of this. The food was pretty good, too. So. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you can reach us all. I've updated the website with everyone's most up-to-date materials. And uh, good luck with uh, going back to machine learning now that you know what deep learning is uh, tomorrow. <laughs> and that's it, the end. <laughs>